welcome, welcome to See Me After Class number 49. Um, let me just, um, I'm just going to tweet this out that this is happening. Because stream la or stream deck, my stream deck is not working for some fucking reason. And I just want to let people know that the podcast has started right now as opposed to um, the premiere stream. Okay, so here we go. We're doing we're doing a podcast now. This is no longer the premiere stream. How's it going, everybody? Most of you were just here, so I gotta pour myself a glass of wine here. Sorry. My mic is not off. Fuck you. You ever notice that it's classy to only fill a, a wine glass halfway? But then if you fill it near or at the brim, that means you're an alcoholic who's beyond saving. <laughs> Look at that guy. He's a mess. He's just drunk. All right. Uh, let me go over my material. What have I got to talk about today? Um, I got... Let me... I'll go briefly over some of the highlights here. Um, Jesse Lee Peterson. I've been watching him on YouTube. I've been walk. I've been t up in the fascinated with the simping, the simp phenomenon that's been going on lately. Um, I wanted to talk more about capitalism and communism. More politics, people. Isn't that fucking great? I'm sure you're all over the moon doing somersaults. Like, literally right now. Um, I want to talk about uh, YouTube. Cra constantly cracking down on its content creators. I want to talk about Trudeau banning guns in Canada. Or all assault-style weapons, quote-unquote. Uh, I want to talk about the Sonic movie. I want to talk about Hallmark movies. I want to talk about... What else? Oh, yeah. An accusation over um, a, a survey done on... An exit survey. It was just one person on Patreon, but I got accused of being something that I don't think I am. And um, indie games... What else? The Last of Us 2 plot leaks. Although I gotta be careful what I say about that, otherwise I'll get fucking silenced by Naughty Dog. Apparently they're on a... They're on a bit of a... Uh, what would you call it? They're silencing a lot of people because they don't want any word getting out about what happens in the game, but it's a little late for that, unfortunately. Some suspicious things going on going on over there at Sony and Naughty Dog, but yeah. Anyway, fuck. Looking good. Oh, thanks, man. Um. So yeah, we're we're in the middle of a crisis, people. There's a crisis happening, and there's nothing we can do. Except just, you know. And uh, we all know what that crisis is. I don't have to say it. But I will. I'll just come right out and say it. I'll confirm what the crisis is that we're all in. I-dubs is a simp. That's just the way it is. That's the crisis that we are living in. 
the whole world is in the crisis of iDubs being a simp. But you know what? You know what, people? We're going to get through this. We just got to stick together. <laughs> we are going to get through this, okay? We all just got to hold hands. <laughs> There's a light at the end of the tunnel, okay? Oh, I also heard th I also heard there was a pandemic. But you know, that's that's neither here nor there. I mean, compared to something like iDubs being a simp, come on now. We got to get our priorities right. Uh that's the lame thing about this um coronavirus. I I I made a tweet I tweeted, you guys. I tweeted a tweet on Twitter, and it was about how this virus is very dangerous. Be it's even worse than we thought because it's turning people into YouTubers. Can you imagine such a thing? What a terrible fate. Um... Everyone is turning into a cringy YouTuber because of this thing. People like you and me, people on big shots on TV who used to have audiences full of people, they're now broadcasting from home. Everyone's a cringy YouTuber now. Now all thanks to this virus. Oh my god, guys. I can feel it happening. I'm I'm turning into a YouTuber. The virus is turning me into one. Hey, what's going on, YouTube? It's your boy, John Graham. And I'm a full-on YouTuber now. And I talk like this. And I snap my fingers and I move my hands around like this. And I'm a YouTuber now. That's what that means. And it's all thanks to this coronavirus. So how's it going, people? We got lots of stuff, lots of stuff to talk about. How are we all doing tonight? I'm a YouTuber now, you guys. I'm a YouTuber, so that means I talk like this. That's everybody now. Everybody in the where are the jump cuts? Oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Fake. This isn't 60 frames per second. You know, I tried to set it to 60 frames per second, but uh, I, th I don't think my webcam is good enough. I think all the real, uh, the quote unquote real YouTubers, they use like, uh, they use DSLRs. I'm just using like a, like a Logitech webcam. It might do 60 frames per second if it was set to like, uh, I think if you set it to 720p max resolution, then it'll do. It might do 60 frames per second, but I'm not sure. But um, I don't really see. I don't think it's a big deal if I just broadcast at 30 or even 24, just because at least you know it looks cinematic. I don't think the 60 frames per second look is necessary, you know. But that's just me. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a plebe who doesn't know any better. 30 frames per second? <laughs> Pathetic. What should we talk about first? Fucking YouTube. I've gone I've gone I've ranted about YouTube before, but it's just like I feel like there's there's always like a new story where YouTube is cracking down on YouTubers. Like there's a new crackdown on Twitch and YouTube every fucking week. It's it seems like you know. And it's like god enough already. Like even just like we can't talk about coronavirus. I know I've said the word already and it means I'm demonetized. I don't give a fuck. Okay? I'm th sh I'm annoyed by the this thing that we we can't talk about the, the fucking elephant in the room. Oh, don't talk about coronavirus. How can we not? 
why would you demonetize something is so it's on everyone's mind but it's just like if you talk about the the don't talk about that thing that's on everyone's mind otherwise you get demonetized oh and by the way we're cracking down on youtubers for the x for the nth umpteenth time this month it's like fuck off youtube like seriously just fuck off like i i really i don't think they should be in the position of policing their content you know because it's just it's too vast a pool of people to pol for one entity to police i think you know i i i what i think is the way to go is to let the community police themselves you know and uh i'm just sick of like you know youtube youtube slogan is broadcast yourself right but who is really themselves on YouTube? Anyone who is actually themselves on YouTube gets fucking banned or deplatformed or demonetized or whatever the fuck. YouTube doesn't encourage people to be themselves. Okay? It encourages mainstream opinions and avoiding controversial subjects. Controvers controversial subjects are the only fucking interesting things to talk about. I mean, you, you can, you can, f there's worthwhile discussion to be had in more neutral topics like video games or whatever, but like, it's not nearly as interesting as talking about controversial subjects that are on everybody's mind, but then people get penalized for talking about those sort of things. And, uh, you might have noticed that I don't run any ads on my stuff. Any, I used to, but not anymore. Because I'm worried about losing my channel over this shit. Because I, I'm too liberal with the F word and the N word. Not the N, not so much uh, the N word. I'm very, I've only, I've only used that a couple of times, but I'm very sparing with it. The F word, I've used pretty liberally in R B and the Chief. But people know where I'm coming from, you know. I'm sure I have a bunch of gay fans who are, they don't care, you know, because they know where my heart's at. They know I don't I don't hate anybody based on things that they can't control. I think that's fucking stupid. But I don't I don't want to be I don't want to have I don't want to risk my channel being removed on the grounds that I try to monetize quote unquote hateful content. You know, the determining factor of a video being hateful being that it contains the F word. You know what I mean? You know what F word I'm talking about? F A G. I just say it right now, but I want to not say it to make the point that I'm not, I don't have to say it. You know what I mean? But I do, I have to say I do hate saying F word or N word. I'd rather just say the actual word. But in order to avoid ruffling feathers, I'll just say F word and N word. I'll concede that. You know what I mean? Just because like. You know, it's not that important to me that I have to say the word, but. I would prefer that people didn't censor themselves, you know? This is why I'm such a free speech advocate. I want people to say whatever the fuck they want, as long as it doesn't escalate into violence, you know what I mean? Even if it's repugnant, as long as it's just speech, then it's like, whatever, give me what you got. Let me hear what you have to say. Because if you hold a position that I don't agree with, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear how you justify your position. And I want you to be linguistically unhindered from saying what you have to say about your position. How else am I going to understand? You know what I mean? If you censor language and you censor people, you end up driving this shit underground. You end up driving actual hate underground. And then it just festers and, and, then it, and eventually blows up into this big fucking thing. I don't want anyone silenced. I don't want anyone deplatformed. I go out of my way to listen to hateful people. Not because I agree with their position, but because, surprise, I want to hear how they rationalize their fucking position. So I can think about their argument and think how about how I might go about deconstructing it. 
And that's how I think everybody should be treating arguments they don't agree with. And everybody should be willing to debate their ideas. You know, it's like, bring it on. If you, if you don't agree with me, l let me hear why you don't agree with me. And I'll, t I'll, t I'll explain my position. You explain your position. We're both linguistically unhindered. We can say, use whatever words we want. And hopefully it, it, avo it strays from ad hominem attacks, you know, and it sticks to the facts. But ultimately, I don't want to see anybody's language censored. But, you know, we, we live in this polarizing time right now where everybody's worried about what other people are going to think based on what they say. And people are worried about losing their channels, so they want to clean themselves up. But then they lose their edge. I don't want to turn into that. You know, I want to I want to come on here. I want to say what I have to say. But I don't I don't harbor any hate towards anybody. You know what I mean? Like. I want to be able to say naughty words in a joking context. You know? and it, But, like, these big tech companies, they look at these f red flag words. And, you know, just context doesn't matter. And if you just say the word, that's bad enough to, to possibly get you banned or whatever. I'm a free speech advocate. And if any of you listening right now have a problem with that, I respect your position. I really do. But I don't agree. And I don't know what to tell you other than that, you know, because I think it's it's too important. Free speech is too important to lose. You know, and I feel like we're at this fork in a road as a society where we got to decide, like, what rights do we want to keep and what rights do we want to forfeit? You know? And that's not a decision to be made lightly because once you hand over a right, it's gone. You're probably not going to get it back or it's going to be extremely hard to get it back. Free speech is gay, though. Uh, I forgot. Whoops. Whoops. Anyway, yeah. Um, most of the people on YouTube are uh, that I listen to are who y YouTube and companies like them would consider deplorables. You know? And uh, I just listen to them because I think they're either funny or informative to some degree. That doesn't mean I agree with them. But I like their takes on things. And, uh, like, any v YouTube videos that I see on, like, the trending page, most of that shit I find intolerable, you know? Where it's like, uh, you know, it's like, How many M&Ms can I eat in 30 seconds? And it's got a thumbnail of, like, a super colorful thumbnail of, like, a guy holding M&Ms and a guy, like, a guy's face going, like, doing that fucking soy smile to the camera. And then it's like the the title is in alternating all caps and lowercase, like like how many M and M's can I eat in thirty seconds? And then like a series of question marks and exclamation marks in a row, you know. I'm just like, Fuh. and I guess like a million views. I'm like, how do people f uh, like people can find entertainment in anything, but. I'm just, I'm baffled by what catches on, you know, what qualifies as mainstream on YouTube. It's just so much stupid shit. Uh, but, you know. So, that's always on my mind. But I don't think I have enough, I don't mean to inflate my significance either. Because I don't think I have enough, I don't have enough of, I'm pretty sure I don't have enough of a presence on YouTube for anyone to be concerned with me just yet or with the videos I'm putting out. But at some point, you know, if I were to get a few hundred thousand more subscribers and then more people throughout the world start paying attention to me and then they start looking at my backlog of videos and they're going, oh, this guy used some problematic language. 
we better do something about this. And then, you know, they get like a, a crowd riled up somewhere and then they start flagging my videos. That might happen. I don't know. And uh, it's unsettling to think about. It's a thing about. This is another thing I wanted to talk about being a YouTuber. You know, people people look up to it like it's this really awesome, easy thing. And there are aspects of it that are easy. I mean, it's I mean, it's not nearly as suicide inducing as a nine to five job, you know, and there there are a lot of parts of my job that I genuinely find joy in. I enjoy it. But uh, there's it's not all it's not all peaches and cream. You know what I mean? Like if you're a YouTuber and you make content on the Internet, you and, it, and if you actually want to be yourself, if you actually want to abide by YouTube's slogan, broadcast yourself, and you decide you actually want actually want to broadcast yourself, which most people don't, you put yourself out there. You know? You, you put your personality out there for the world to see, warts and all. And it's not all good. And you're going to get criticized. And you got to be willing to face that criticism. That comes with the job. And not everyone's willing to tolerate that. And I think a lot of those people who are super sensitive to that are advocates for, like, you know, silencing people. It's like, I don't want to hear, I don't want to read any bad comments. I just want to listen. I, don't, I just want to read the compliments and ban everybody else. And um, I, I get the feeling because I'm a bitch when it comes to criticism i don't like being criticized i don't like when people say bad things about me i get really upset when i feel like i've upset somebody else um but it just it comes with the gig and you got to be willing to put up with it but as as upset as i would be with somebody having a problem with me i don't advocate deplatforming anybody or silencing people you know, it's like, okay, you got something bad to say, fine, but say what you have to say, you know, and um, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not, it's not all easy. There's some emotional turmoil that you have to take along with the job of putting your personality out there on the web. And because of the polarization in term, you know, in society and politics and all that, and like the whole hate speech argument, free speech, hate speech. You know, um, what's okay, what isn't, what can you say, what can't you say. Um, it's a risk, you know, because a lot, a lot of my income comes through my web presence, and that that those revenue streams could go out the window. You know, if my channel was demonetized, I wouldn't get super chats anymore, probably. I don't think so. I think ad revenue and super chats are both lumped into the same monetization of that one channel. You know what I mean? So if, if I get demonetized, all that goes. Um, maybe I get banned off Patreon. Other Other people have been banned off Patreon for saying the wrong thing. You know? And maybe it'll be something that I say at the time. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll be for something that I said in the past because there's an archive of everything that I've said. And it's like maybe I said something in the past that I maybe I regret it. Maybe it was out of line. But maybe it could be used against me at some point in the future and maybe I might lose everything. And um, it's a risk. And because of that risk, that's part of the reason that I haven't pursued any relationships with whammon sorry I know I, I'm getting pretty serious and I'm pretty I'm exposing myself quite a bit here but I hope you guys are okay with this but this is something that's been on my mind a lot you know and you know if you're curious because people have asked me about this kind of thing before like do you worry about this kind of shit and absolutely I do you know like if I if I had if I was a YouTuber, right? And I had a family to support. If I got in a relationship and I had kids, 
all of a sudden I have an obligation to provide for them, right? And then at that point, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't say I would be in, in an optimal position to take any risks. So I, th I find that with a bunch of YouTubers when they get, they, they start off edgy when they're s single young guys or girls, but mostly guys, right? Um, they're single young guys and they start off making edgy content and then they get married and then they have kids and then what do they do? They clean themselves up. They stop swearing. They, they, they're very careful about what they say. They avoid controversial subjects because they want to ensure they want to stay advertiser friendly because they want to ensure that that money keeps rolling in so they can provide for their family. Now, it sucks that they are going against their roots and they're probably not as funny as they used to be by straying from being controversial. But they are providing for their family as a result. And so what is the superseding morality there? You know what I mean? Maybe when, once you have a family, maybe you have an obligation to provide for them at all costs and maybe taking risks, making edgy jokes, isn't the right thing to do anymore. And the problem with me is I don't want to forfeit that. I want to be able to say what I want to say. I want to make edgy jokes. I want to be a shit lord. I want to shit post. I mean, that's writing dialogue for Master Chief. That's essentially what it is, is shit posting just in a cinematic form. You know, I want to keep doing that because I think it's funny <laughs> and I have a very immature sense of humor and I gravitate towards controversial subjects. I gravitate towards taboos. Um, but maybe if I were to have a family, maybe that would be irresponsible of me and maybe I shouldn't do that. And there's a real argument to be had there. I mean, what is the proper way to conduct yourself in that case? And so I end up deciding maybe a relationship isn't the way to go for me at least not yet i i don't know when it's going to be okay for me you know because i feel like i'm always going to be perceived as a risk you know if i have a family and then i get all demonetized and shit i mean this isn't i mean i can just if i no longer have an internet presence i can just get a 9 to 5 job whatever you know and, uh, or, you know, work in a trade or something. I got nothing against an honest day's labor, you know. I respect anybody who does it. I don't consider myself above that sort of thing. And I would do that if I had to. The fact is, I can make a living doing this YouTube shit. And I'm quite happy doing it. So, I'll keep doing it for as long as I can. Because I like making videos. I like editing videos. I like having complete creative control over my content. I like writing. I like writing jokes. I like humor. I like comedy. I don't want to give that up. You know? And so, uh, I find myself in a very tough, unsettling spot where I don't want to do, I don't know what to do with my life. You know, I feel like I'm at this fork in the road and I'm just standing at the fork and I'm getting older and older and older. I'm like 30, 31. I'm going to be 32 next month. And my hairline is receding. I know you guys can see it. You make jokes about it. It's funny. Yes. It also makes me sad to know that I'm basically a 15 year old trapped in an aging 30 year old man's body. And, um,. I feel this paralysis where, you know, I don't know what the right direction to go in is. I know there's people, I'm not reading the chat right now because it would be too distracting, but I know there's people probably in the chat writing, blah, 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 shut up, John, get on with the jokes. But um, I think this is a worthwhile thing to point out to people who are curious about the position of being a, a YouTuber. It's not all great. There's great things about it. It's certainly easier than a than a nine to five where you have to go to like a warehouse or an office every day. Or, you know, well, an office job wouldn't necessarily be harder because maybe you just have a data entry job. It can be rather mind numbing, but because editing isn't easy and shooting all that footage for all the episodes isn't easy either. But I enjoy it. That's the that's the difference, right? 
So, you know, people ask me what my thoughts are on that, and that those are my thoughts. It's not, I'm not entirely content being where I am. You know, I enjoy writing my own content and shit and, you know, being myself, but there is that, there is that underlying feeling of uncertainty where it's like, am I doing the right thing with my life? Um, where am I going to be 10 years from now? Am I going to be banned? Is there going to be like radical policy changes that make it so I can't say what I want anymore? Because who knows where all this political correctness shit is heading. And this, this coronavirus lockdown thing has thrown a whole wrench into things because... Who knows what invasive government policy is going to be passed during this time, and then, you know, what are what are going to what are the manifestations of whatever that policy is going to be like ten years from now? And um, so I avoid relationships, and I spend most of my time alone, and I have a bunch of people who are in relationships. They're about to get married. Some of them have kids already. And I'm just that guy who's still making videos on YouTube with toys. You know what I mean? And it's kind of embarrassing, and I'm ashamed about it sometimes. But when I think about it, I'm like, no, but, like, I'm trying to make it clever. Like, I'm focusing on the writing. It's sharp satire. I feel like I'm doing a worthwhile thing. Maybe if, maybe if I'm making people laugh around the world, that's enough. And, uh... I don't know what I don't know what the big grand answer is at the end of it all, you know. People people come to me for answers about ar- on this shit and I don't know the answers either. And when you reach my age, you'll realize I don't have the answers, you don't have the answers, nobody has the answers, you know? Like I think a lot of people are in this position where they don't know if what they're doing with their life is the right thing or if it'll ever change. I don't know if I'll ever stop feeling this way. I really don't. I don't see, I don't see the end of my path isn't in sight. But I do find some kind of gratification in that, in the unpredictability of it, in the uncertainty of it. Like compared to somebody who's building a family, right? And they can see where their lives are going to be 10 years down the line, probably. I don't know where I'm going to be 10 years from now. But there's something exciting about that, you know? And... That's just, that's, that's just life. You know, you're along for the ride. That's, that's kind of, that's how I treat life right now. I'm just along for the ride. I do this one day at a time. And as long as I work hard on my videos and I make people laugh, I feel like I'm doing something good. You know, because there's a lot of people who have quote unquote real jobs who, not they not only hate their job but they feel like they're not actually doing anything worthwhile to their com- for their community or the world at large like they f- not only do they hate their job but their job is effectively useless and they wish they would be doing something else some people see a, see somebody in a position like me and they envy me because they oh I wish I could do what John does I wish I was a YouTuber well it's not all great you know it's there's a psychological effect, a detrimental one of working from home where you don't have a definitive place of work to go to. There's something to be said for that. When you're doing all your wor- your work at home and you don't I mean, I've I've had 10 years pretty much to deal with it and work it out in my work out those work through those feelings in my head. So, I've got an I've got a head start there. But it wasn't an easy thing to adjust to. You know, so, I know I've rambled on quite a bit. I know I'm probably boring some people, but I know there's some of you in the chat who are like, this is real shit, you know? And I, I want to be real on this podcast. I want I want this to be of value to people. I, you know, I want you to know the downsides of being a YouTuber. It's not all great. Um, I have, I have serious feelings of uncertainty when it comes to how my life is unfolding and I measure it by how much joy that I bring you guys I really do at the end of the day 
I mean, the like, like these premiere streams where I get to see you guys all like, hey, that was awesome. Great episode, man. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for making me laugh when I needed it. I kind of measure my life, the effectiveness of my life as like that. Like, am I bringing joy to the people who want to see content from me? And it's like, okay, yes, I did a good job. And I've said in the past that if I were to die tomorrow, I would actually be happy knowing that I have the body of work that I have. Saying like, well, I'm dead, but at least I made a good show. And I would hope that people would say that about me. It's like, hey, he's gone now, but hey, he has this wealth of content. You know, he didn't cure, John didn't cure cancer. He didn't do anything that was revolutionary or anything on that scale. But he did make a good show and he made me laugh and he made other people laugh around the world. And that's enough. That's the most I can hope for from my from my life. And I think if people can say about say that about me already, then I've won. You know, I feel like I could die happily tomorrow if I knew that for sure. You know. And I, I think I think that is the case. If I were to die tomorrow, I think most people would be like, you know, that guy was cool. He made he made good shit. That was funny. You know? There you go. That's my thoughts on YouTube and being a YouTuber. I wanted to, I thought that was important. So I'm sorry if that was dull or boring. Um, but that was important to me and God forbid I talk about something I want to talk about on my own fucking podcast. So there you go. Um, I hope you guys found value in that. What would uh, what would you guys like me to talk about next? I got I got material here. I mentioned some things. I don't know what to. I fucking hate doing this. Like I, I'm way more comfortable with the super chats because it's like, I'm being, f like I'm being handed a topic. It's like here, talk about this. But when it's stuff that I have written down, it's just like I don't really know what to go for first, and it feels inorganic. Just, I don't know. Fuck. It's just a weird kind of feeling, because I'm a pretty insecure guy, and I know what you're thinking. You look at a person like me and you think, there's John Graham. He's got life all figured out. He's the talk of the town. He's handsome. He's uh, irresistible. He's funny. He knows the answer to all of life's questions. How could you possibly feel insecure? Well, the truth is I, I feel insecure a lot. In fact, I probably I probably would have had another borderline anxiety attack had I not had a glass of wine before I started streaming today. Because the last time I started streaming, right before, my heart started racing. I almost went into a full-blown attack. But I, 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 I managed to hold it off. I managed to control myself. And I managed it, and I brought my, I brought my heart rate down, and I was fine. But um, it's... It's not easy. I can't I can't just live my life in on camera. I mean, it seems maybe I'm uh maybe I'm assuming things on my end about other YouTubers about how it seems so easy for them, but maybe it's just as maybe it's just as hard for them too. You know, I'm thinking about guys like PewDiePie or Keemstar or whoever just like makes makes this a daily thing you know it's just like you know they wake up in the morning and they're just like all right time to go on camera and then they're in front of the camera and then they have no problems talking to people like i can never feel that way i'm always fuck a bundle of a tight bundle of fucking nerves every time i i i broadcast myself because i'm just like do i have everything set up oh my god am i gonna fucking say them i'm gonna am i gonna say something stupid on this stream that's going to get me banned or people are going to be pissed off at and um or am I going to embarrass myself somehow or and or th all that aside just the mere fact that I know that I'm being watched in a room where I am physically by myself 
is a feeling that I've never become accustomed to. It's a very weird sensation. So there's a lot of anxiety that comes with this position. Just because I appear to speak confidently on camera and I might make you laugh, don't think for one second that I am secure <laughs> mentally. Don't think that I am secure mentally What you know, based on what I'm doing right now and how confident I might seem because I'm really not. I'm not comf I'm not confident with myself. I'm not confident about where my life is going to turn out or how my life is going to turn out. I'm not confident about where I'm going to be years from now. I just take it one day at a time and um I try to ignore it as best as I can and just try to enjoy the moment, you know. It's like I'm a, anxious as I was starting this podcast. I'm feeling pretty good now. Like, I've, I mean, especially since I've had a couple drinks, obviously, but I'm feeling like every time I do this, alcohol or not, I feel pretty comfortable a ways into it, you know, where it's like, I feel like it wouldn't be the same if it was like, like if I had, a th like, I don't know if, like, say PewDiePie, does he do... He probably does live streams, right? He doesn't just pre-record his stuff by himself. He probably does live streams and then he makes videos out of that. But how many people must he have watching him at any given time when he's doing a live stream? Like at least a thousand live viewers? Probably way more than that. And then his chat would probably be like just a fucking like... <laughs> like this. Where it's like, I'm not even going to read that. Fuck that. How do you even engage with an audience like that you know, when it's just that many people? At least a th you're quoting me there as if that was a dumb estimate. I don't know. Yeah, I'm s probably stupid when it comes to so some of this shit, but I figure at least a thousand or it could be way more than that. I'm just saying bare minimum, you know? Some guy on Twitter asked me a question. He said... Um, He asked me something along the lines of whether I would agree I'm in an optimal position because I don't have PewDiePie numbers in terms of subscriptions and viewers and all that. And I agreed. I was like, yeah, I think I'm in a, I think I'm better off with a smaller amount of subscribers and viewers than somebody with way more subscribers and viewers because they are under way more scrutiny based on what they say and do. You know, even if they do something that's benign, it's like it's under that because there's that many more people watching the likelihood that somebody is going to have a problem with them increases dramatically. And if that were the case with me, that would drive me fucking crazy because even just one person on Twitter saying that they have a serious problem with me would ruin my day. <laughs> I would be really upset because if anybody is upset by me, I get upset. If I feel like I've upset anybody. Because I'm always trying to make people laugh at the end of the day. That's it. But at the same time, I also feel this temptation. I also gravitate towards taboo subjects where it's like, if I'm going to tackle this topic, I'm inevitably going to piss people off. And there's a hypocritical part of me that doesn't want to accept that fact. It's just like, I want I want to have my cake and eat it too. I want to I wanna deal with... I want to joke about the controversial subject and I want everybody on my side at the same time, but I can't have it that way. You know? It's uh one comes with the other. If you if you want to deal with taboos and you want to be a fucking edge lord like me, you got to be willing to face the criticism. And I am. I mean, I I I don't I don't fucking silence anybody. Like, if I'm willing to have my ideas challenged. I mean, especially, like, if somebody is uh, is rude to me, that can piss me off. But, like, if somebody criticizes me but they're super nice about it, I'll respond. And I'll, like, I'm quite happy about that. If somebody disagrees with me but they politely send me a message saying, hey, I don't agree, could you please elaborate on your position or... Or even if they don't add that second part of that. But if they're just like, if they disagree with me, but they, and they criticize me, but they're nice about it, 
I'm super appreciative of that. And I usually let them know. And I'll respond because I'm quite happy to defend my own ideas. So um, I might as well segue into this thing now because we're talking about this. Um, I read my Patreon exit surveys every now and then. Um, I don't like to. <laughs> because I always kind of like click on that page apprehensively because I don't know what people are going to say. I'm just like, oh, my God, who have I pissed off this month? You know? And it, it, if if it is criticism, it's like it hurts more because they paid me some amount of money, even if it's just a dollar that month or whatever. If they've got something bad to say about me, I'm just like, oh, my God, like, how did I screw up? All right, let's just read it. But, you know, I'll, I'll it's like tearing off a Band-Aid, you know, I'll just fuck it. I'll just do it. It's part of the job of being a content creator, you know. And so I looked at it earlier this month. And I saw this comment. It wasn't a month ago. It was more recent than that. But um, one of the one of the comments somebody left, uh, somebody had subscribed to me, and then they they revoked their pledge, and they said, "I'm tired of supporting a creator who cultivates an alt right hive mind." Okay, an alt right hive mind. Now I read that, and I was upset. And I also felt that that was just wrong, you know, because like if I if somebody criticizes me, but it's valid, then I'll take it, you know, as much as I don't like to be criticized. If it's valid, I will accept it. I might it might take me a little bit of time. I might have to think about it. But uh, I'll take it. But that was a circumstance where I, I read that and I was like, that's wrong. I really don't think I do that. I think my entire body of work for the past over the past 10 years runs against that claim that I'm cultivating an alt-right hive mind. I mean, what what constitutes alt-right? Because I make joke about fucking Pepe the Frog and like f what else? What else is con vaguely considered alt-right? The fact that I go on 4chan I don't even post on 4chan. I lurk 4chan, but apparently that's enough to make you alt right, I guess. Or because I am resistant to SJW woke culture, because I make jokes about that, even though I've also made fun of conservatives with the racist character. But apparently, just being. Apparently, attacking both sides and trying to promote a general message of open mindedness and thinking critically for yourself. Apparently, that's enough to get you defined as being alt-right. And uh, that pisses me off. And it just kind of, in a way, it makes me... I was upset, but I also felt like I'm kind of doing the right thing, doing what I'm doing, because this mentality should be made fun of. This idea that anything even remotely outside of far left is considered far right, you know? Like if, if you're if you're not an SJW, if you're not far left leaning, that that automatically means you're far right. There's absolutely no middle ground. There's no moderate right. There's no right leaning. There's no centrist. There's no respectable centrist position to occupy. There's no left leaning. There's only far left or right left. And that's or far left and far right. That's what I meant. And that's it. <laughs> there's no fucking other. There's no room on the spectrum for anything other than those things. And um, I don't agree. And I think this is a serious problem that needs to be addressed. It needs to be discussed. It needs to be dealt with without violence. People need to be able to debate this shit. And work this out through words. The power of speech. This is why free speech is so important. I tweeted about this. I'll just read out my tweet again that I made. Because I think it sums up my thoughts on this pretty adequately so this is this is what I said okay um, sorry I'm just navigating to the thing oh, this f my fucking Twitter home feed it doesn't show my it's sometimes it doesn't show the tweets I made hang on I just gotta fucking scroll through my notifications to find it god that's really annoying Oh, my 
my god. Here we go, okay? I was accused in the Patreon exit survey of cultivating a far-right hive mind. Quote, unquote. I'm sorry if anyone gets that impression of me because it's genuinely not my intent. Let me be clear that I consider the left and right broadly as equally valid modes of thought. I thought I was clear. They're like the left and right hemispheres of the brain. You wouldn't dispose of one or the other. Sometimes the answers lie on one side or the other, sometimes both. Depends on the issue. This is why free discussion between the sides is so important. The only alternative to negotiation is violence. I never want things to come to the latter. Being a free speech advocate is not quote unquote far right. And then I added to that. Also, I don't mean to blow one person's comment out of proportion and imply that a substantial amount of people think this of me. I know better than that. I just saw the comment as something worthy of highlight and a little elaboration. It's a hot issue. So that was all I said on Twitter. And, uh, yeah, I didn't mean... I After I made the initial tweet, I realized that it might have sounded like I was taking this one comment that somebody made and going like, Hey, look at this. I'm being censored, everybody. Look at this one guy with his one comment. Look, I'm being censored, everybody. This is anti-free speech. I didn't want to blow it out of proportion like that. I'm just... Like, I saw this comment, and I was just like, this raises a valuable point that I would like to elaborate a little bit on on Twitter. And that's what I did. And um, it seemed to be received pretty well. I think most the vast majority of people agree with me. But the thing about that... Patreon survey was that it was the f it was just it was just one guy it wasn't a collection of people who all got together and made up this decision about me it was just one guy but it was the first time that I ever was accused of that and not only that but it was from a subscriber it was somebody who had faith in me and then changed their mind based on the content I was putting out and and then they turned they turned against me I guess and they decided that my values didn't align with theirs and and um of course if no if somebody wants to not support me anymore for whatever reason they're not they're under no obligation to explain themselves but um i just i couldn't help but be baffled by that because i think my message has always been one of um getting people to think for themselves you know don't subscribe to ideology on either side of the political spectrum, you know? F to find the facts, look at all of them, and then come to your own conclusion. Don't, f don't formulate a conclusion and then get look at all the facts and then discard the facts that don't support your predetermined conclusion and then just, you know, then just use the facts you're left with to be like, hey, look, my predetermined conclusion is the, is the right thing. Like, that's, that's just the wrong way to live life. You know what I mean? You got to fucking always just take all the facts into account and then distill that into the best, the most accurate truth that you can surmise. But then that's going to be different from everybody. Everybody has a certain side of the truth, you know, whether it's on the left or the right, because they're both valid. Broadly speaking, they're both valid, right? But everybody is going to have their own side of the truth. So everybody has a little piece of the puzzle. And that's we if we all get together and talk, then we can better put them all together and come to what would be referred to as objective truth, right? And um there's a weird thing going on with that too, I think in the mainstream in society where this idea of individual truth and objective truth and there is an arg there is arg there are arguments to be made for both but the idea that objective truth doesn't exist is a serious problem that i think needs to be discussed intelligently you know because if you completely ad if you completely adopt the idea that every individual has their truth i mean it's the word truth right if you're saying my truth right it's like well my truth is this then because truth is the highest ideal, right? The word of you can't you can't speak any better, more good thing than the, tr the truth. 
So if if you're making the ceiling of the concept of truth your your being and not taking anybody else into account then that's basically human secularism right where you think all your truth is the only one that matters and then forget everyone everybody else this is i'm going to say the word get ready for it brace yourselves hold on to something are you ready postmodernism i know i'm sorry i said the word but there you go we're talking about it again so the definition of postmodernism is that all interpretations of everything are equally valid okay and it's not the case if i were to come up to you and say hey my interpretation of batman versus superman was that it was a really good movie and you were to be like no that movie sucked shit it's all m medium close ups and the script is so poorly written that you could take any one of those scenes, shuffle them around, and it wouldn't matter because one scene doesn't flow into the other like a script should. There's no such thing as a... Under postmodernism, there's no such thing as something objectively sucking. It's basically all that matters is your interpretation. If you thought a shitty thing was good, it's good. There you go. doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. That's your truth, right? And your truth is all that matters. So, and notice I said a shitty movie. That's objective th truth coming in, right? Where it's like something can objectively be good or bad, right? If I hit two wrong sounding notes on a piano, you're going to get one of, you're going to get, if you're going to get one of two reactions from that. You're either going to go, oh, that was a bad chord. You shouldn't have hit those notes. Or, wow, those notes really go together. That was a great sounding chord, right? So you, there is such a thing as something being objectively true or objectively bad. And look, there's probably people in the chat right now who think I'm oversimplifying postmodernism or oversimplifying something and I've got something wrong, whatever. I'm sure I'm not. I'm doing my best to articulate my thoughts on something that is really complex. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. In fact, I encourage you to send me an email and explain to me why I'm, why I'm wrong. And I'll probably offer to read your email out on the stream because I am actually open to having my ideas challenged. I want to get to the bottom of things. I don't want to come up with my own preconceived idea of what's right and what's wrong and then just dig my heels in and be like, everyone else is wrong, doesn't matter, la 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 la. I'm not listening. I don't want to be like that. I want to get to the bottom of things, you know? So, if you've disagreed with anything that I've said, I encourage you to email me. And there is an email that I would like to read out, and I'm going to do that now. This is from a guy. He, he emailed me in response to my thoughts on that Patreon's exit survey. And this is from a guy. I'm not going to ad identify him. I don't think he wants to be ad identified. I don't think he specified, but I'm, I'm just, to be, to be safe, I'm not going to name who he is but he was a guy who supported me financially through patreon and then he stopped because he disagreed with my ideas but then he resubbed again because he he thought about his feelings and he changed his mind and he sent me this really even though he doesn't agree with everything that i've said on my podcast and of course he doesn't have to he sent me this really thoughtful email that i really appreciated and I want to read it out to you guys. And I want to go over it beat by beat. Because I think it's really important. Okay? So, just let me... I, I know maybe some of you are bored. But just let me do this, okay? Because I think this is important. I think this is valuable. Okay? So... Okay, here's here's the email. Okay? Listen to this. I would like to give my thoughts as a fan who is a black American. And although I didn't do a survey, I had suspended my patron donation to you for a while for a similar reason. That reason being what I mentioned earlier about the uh, flirting with alt-right ideas, right? By no means do I mean I ever thought you were hateful in any way. I just felt I couldn't support you monetarily, and it was a tough decision for me. I have since 
recently continued my donations to you because I enjoy your content thoroughly and even though I don't agree, I want to support what you do. Back when I suspended my contributions, I felt, perhaps incorrectly, that your flirtation with your flirtation with right-wing ideas meant an acceptance of what the American right-wing politicians do. Not just that, but it's that age-old dilemma of what can you do? Some people are going to watch because they believe in that edgy humor. They might feel validated by everyone else laughing, but that's not your fault. I was a hypocrite for sure. I make jokes and whatnot all the time. Racist jokes, anti-Semitic jokes, etc., etc. I've always loved edgy humor, but I felt there was a distinction between doing so publicly versus privately. Yet the biggest laughs I've ever gotten from your stream were from donors like that guy Shekelblatt <laughs> that made me laugh in insanely hard. I conflated your being a fan of Jordan Peterson to believing in a set of ideals I did not. I had finally realized that there is a, there is a difference between believing in a few ideas and believing in them all. The Democratic Party here in America is fucking corrupt and I will shit talk them as much as anyone. Joe Biden? What the fuck? Can we talk about his rape allegations, please? Quote, the party of women, my ass. It's insanely clear you're not a hateful person, and I'm not sure what you can do to eliminate this idea of cultivating a far-right hive mind, quote-unquote, from the heads of fans who are pretty left, such as myself. It's not that I saw it as an attack on me, but I was making incorrect conflations slash connections with your ideas. I don't dislike some right-wing ideals, but when I see the history of the right-wing in my country, I don't exactly have the best view of them. At the same time, it seems like the, on it seems like the left only ever does action when it's convenient, and I've shifted more from right slash left to political class slash working people and sorry, I just lost my place here. Finan and financial elite slash lower financial class. Not to say I'm a pinko commie SOB. I still consider myself someone who believes capitalism slash socialism have some great ideas that we could move together to create social safety nets, production slash innovation, and opportunity. I emailed you a while ago after your Pedophile Park podcast episode and remarked how I wished you did more research about the political slash social topics you talked about. Hearing that last podcast was amazing with how you said you listened to a bunch of debates and it showed when you were discussing those ideas again and was an insane boon to my enjoyment of the episode. Anyway, in conclusion, my enjoyment of your work and podcast has never been higher and I'm happily contributing to your Patreon again because I realize I was wrong in stopping it in the first place. Thank you for addressing the issue on Twitter. And if I had to give advice to dispel that image, just keep doing what you're doing. Nothing you've done has ever seemed malicious, only critical. You always make sure to have a nuanced view. And I will happily support my favorite creator just because of that. Sorry this was so long, but it's something... I've mulled over in my head a lot over the past few years. Hope you're having an excellent day and stay safe out there. Perfectly reasonable email, right? Doesn't agree with everything I've said, but who does? This is my point. Everyone has a, sh everyone has a side of how things are, you know? And we've got to listen to each other, right? To figure out the big truth that's hovering above all our heads, you know what I mean? Like... The truth that if the objective truth that affects us all, because I do believe in objective truth. I'm not one of these individual truth guys, you know. Well, and there is an argument to be made for it, but you got to be careful how far you run with that. You know what I mean? So, a couple things in this. Um, first of all, he's black, so I got to ask him for an N word pass. <laughs> Sorry, I had to I had to make that joke. I gotta get an N word pass from somebody. It has to be a black guy though. I need an emergency black guy for an N word pass. 
I'm just kidding. Um, so he felt he couldn't support me monetarily, and that's fine. If somebody doesn't share my values, they shouldn't support me. And they certainly don't owe me an apology or anything like that. So, I mean, I got no problem with that. Um, although I would encourage that person to email me and tell me what it is they think I'm doing wrong. And I might have a rebuttal. I might have a counter argument, but I'm not going to be rude about it. Not unless you're rude to me first. But I would never be rude to somebody if it was unprovoked. I don't. That's not the kind of person. I know I make a lot of rude jokes. I know I pr the, the kind of jokes that I make in my content probably make me seem like I'm this fucking asshole, but I'm actually a pretty nice, agreeable guy to a fault. You know, I'm I'm I listen to people all the time, and um, you know, I just I think I'm a very fair open-minded, agreeable person. Anyway. Um, my flirtation with right-wing ideas. Now, flirtation with right-wing ideas. Like I was saying before, I feel like this is what he's talking about here is like Pepe, 4chan, what else is vaguely considered alt-right even though it's not really a I mean, it is politically charged, but I mean, P Pepe, for example, right? Pepe the Frog is not an alt-right symbol to me. To me, Pepe the Frog is the feels-good man frog. He's the frog that pulls down his pants and he pees because it feels good. And he does what he feels is good at the time. That's what Pepe is to me. But he got adopted as this hate symbol and now he's officially recognized as a hate symbol or whatever the fuck's going on there and it's like i just i don't agree with that perception of the frog where it's like if if anybody makes a pepe joke or references pepe that and then that means they're an alt-right figure i think that's stupid i think that that character is essentially apolitical and um do do racist slash alt-right people use that symbol yes but that doesn't that doesn't destroy the entire image of pepe for me like pepe can be used either on the left or the right as a satire of identity politics which can either be prevalent on the left or the right identity politics isn't exclusive to one or the other you can see that same behavior on both sides and uh, besides Pepe, what are some other things that get conflated with racist ideas? I men I mentioned them earlier, just in the same podcast, but I just I can't remember what it was. It's like Pepe and 4chan, and I named a few other things. Where it's like, as soon as you mention them, people automatically conflate that with like, oh, you must be one of those alt-right people. The okay hand sign, yeah, that's that's a weird one, yeah. Cause like th there's like these groups of guys who would do that symbol in photographs, and then they would be called racist or whatever. Even though I think that's a pretty common military thing, or not necessarily the military, but just guys in general. Like, like that's something I grew up with. That okay symbol, if you did that on your knee and you got someone to look at it, that would mean you would give them a Charlie horse. That's what that was to me when you were a kid. Like if you, you, would, you would do that symbol on your knee, right? And then you would say something to the guy to get them to look down at your leg. And then if they looked at the thing, they would go, oh shit. And then that warranted you to give them a Charlie horse. So you would punch that person as hard as you could. And it was just like, it's just a it's a male bonding thing. It's stupid, but that's all it is, you know. But then it got attributed as this white power thing because what like this is supposed to be the W, right? And then the P is like this is the whole of the P and then your arm is like the the arm of the P going down. And um it kind of makes sense, I guess, aesthetically. It's like, okay, I see the W there, but like 
In terms of intent, because that's what we're talking about, right? I think in most cases the intent isn't, isn't that. Does that symbol get used to represent white power? Yes. But just because you do that symbol doesn't mean you're a racist. So that like you have to be careful with like what the the intent is key. Intent is key to to everything. All of these cases, right? And it, like if you're if you're posing for a fucking photograph and you do that symbol, like if you were actually a racist, you would want to probably not do that symbol, right? Like you wouldn't want to provide photographic evidence of the fact that you were a racist. Unless you're just like a full-on hardcore Nazi, I guess, where you're quite happy to announce it to the world. But like there were certain certain photographs where the con in the context of that situation, that photograph being taken, it doesn't really make sense for them to out themselves as a Nazi by doing that symbol. So, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's a confusing, tricky thing to navigate. And, um, but I'm not, I'm not prepared to paint everybody who's ever done that symbol with this broad brush of, oh, they must all be Nazis if they're doing that thing. Because I remember in my childhood where that didn't we mean white power at all. It meant, I'm going to give you a Charlie horse. That's all it was. Or it's just maybe not even that Charlie Horse is a, an essential part of it. It's just like if you trick someone into looking at your hand while you do that symbol, then that's like a it's just a joke or whatever, like a made you look sort of thing. I think that's all it is. Anyway. I feel like I'm boring everybody because everyone's just typing come in the chat. I hope people are I hope people are digging this podcast. Because I'm really opening myself up here. And then it's like, if I get the sense that people are disinterested, it makes me sad. So I hope people are like, I hope people aren't just like, oh, he's just like, he won't stop rambling. Let's just type a bunch of bullshit in the chat. You know what I mean? Anyway, okay. Hopefully I'm wrong. I think I'm wrong. I think most people who are actually digging this just aren't participating in the chat or whatever. Um, anyway, I'm almost done with this email. I just wanted to go over a couple things. So what this guy, even though he doesn't agree with everything I say, he had the introspection to question his own stance and realize that he was making incorrect conflations. Like just because I make jokes about Pepe and 4chan and I talk about the alt-right and stuff. And I talk about the political polarization and how Trump supporters are being all villainized as like evil racists. It's like um, he he conflated that with me being in support of all right wing politicians, I guess. And of course I don't. There's cro there's like corrupt politicians who are on the right side of things everywhere and the left. Like, I think just being in politics, period, there's some degree of corruption that comes along with that, you know? Like, in order to get, especially to escalate to a high position in politics, whether on the left or the right, it involves some degree of corruption either way. And um, so I really appreciated that about this guy where he analyzed his own behavior and he's like, well, maybe I'm making an improper conflation here. Maybe John isn't actually in support of these corrupt right-wing politicians. And I'm not. I mean, it depends what exactly they're doing. You know, just because they have right-wing ideals, that doesn't mean they're corrupt because there's a valid argument to be made, broadly speaking, for conservatism. Because what liberalism and conservatism broadly represent is a state of being closed off versus opened to the world, right? And it's easy to sympathize with the people on the left side of things because they appear immediately empathetic, where it's like, I'm open to the world, welcome all, I'm completely intolerant, I love everybody, come on in, group hug, you know? But then if you're even slightly conservative, where you consider it a good idea sometimes to be closed off to the world, that closing off 
can immediately be misinterpreted as like, oh, you're blocking people out. Therefore, there are certain people that you don't like. Maybe it's based on their race or their religion or something. It means that there's certain people you don't like, and that probably means you're a bad person. And that's what I don't agree with. I don't agree with the demonization of that because there are times in life to be opened up and there are times in life to be closed off, such as when you're getting attacked. If you're in a boxing ring and you're getting punched in the fucking face, you don't want to open yourself up. Yeah, punch me. Go ahead. You want to block, right? You want to put your fucking hands up and stop the guy knocking you out, right? So there's a time to be closed off. Or, you know, if, if you're if you're fucking upset one day, you know, you had a bad day at work and you go home and you, you go into your house, you lock the door, you go into your bedroom, maybe you have roommates or something, maybe you don't feel like talking to them, you go into your bedroom, you close the door, you lie down in the bed, and you're protected by the four walls of your bedroom and you're just there by yourself and you can appreciate that silence and doesn't mean you hate anybody, you know? Eventually, you're going to want to go out and talk to people. But in that particular moment, it's like, I am quite happy to be closed off right now and be by my fucking self. Guess what? That's rooted in conservative values. Okay? Essentially, that's what that is, is conservatism. Or if you want to conserve something, like resources, for example. Like if you want to ration. Like if you know that you're not going to be able to drink water for a week and you've got like a half... If you've got, you've got like a half bottle of water to ration out across the whole period of the week, guess what? You're going to want to be conservative with that bottle of water, you know? Maybe not drink it all on the first fucking day. Conservatism j doesn't just apply to racism. This is this, that's one of the conflations that bugs the shit out of me. And I want to address... You know, whether it's my content or like posts I put on Facebook or whatever, because if we keep going down this road, I don't see it leading to a good place. I don't want to see anybody on either side of the political spectrum to be demonized. OK, because if once you demonize one side, that means you stop talking to that side because you you determine them as villains who cannot be negotiated with. And once you do that, then talking is off the table. And the only alternative to negotiation is violence. And I do not want to see things escalate to violence. This is why I endorse free speech. People talking to each other, especially people who disagree. Okay, so that's my thoughts on that. And then uh, cultivating a far-right hive mind. I mean, like, I mean, if there was ever an overstatement... That makes it sound like I'm building a fucking racist Borg army, like out of Star Trek The Next Generation. Like, imagine Picard out of the Borg, but he's got a big fucking swastika on his head. That's me, you know? I'm the head of this evil Borg army. We are racists, and we are going to take you over. That's what that sounds like. And it's like, you know what? Maybe that's a little bit of an overstatement. You know? I, f I flirt with... With I wouldn't I wouldn't call the the ideas that I flirt with alt right ideas. I mean, what does flirt even mean anyway? Does that mean I accept those ideas? No. Can can I make fun of them? I mean, can can you make fun of something without flirting with it? I mean, flirting seems to occupy this uncomfortable middle ground between making fun of something and accepting something, and it's like which one is it? You know. If I flirt with something. Am I condoning it or am I just making fun of it? Or maybe both. And no, it's not both. But if, if I'm making fun of something like Pepe, I don't consider that something that's inherently on the right side of things. I just see it as a funny frog that's used in the satire of identity politics. So, all right, let's, um, I'm just going to skim this email, make sure I didn't miss anything. So, look, I keep raising my voice and, like, I don't want to make it seem like I'm actually angry or upset. Like, this is just the way I talk on my podcast, okay? Sometimes if, like, if I latch onto an idea and I feel particularly passionate about it, I'm probably going to raise my voice. But that doesn't – I'm not trying to off-put anybody who's listening. I'm not trying – I'm certainly not trying to un offend this guy who wrote this email. 
or even the guy who left me that Patreon survey. I got nothing against that guy. If he doesn't agree with me, fine. He doesn't have to support me. I wish him the best of luck. And, you know, if he changes his mind later on, great. If he doesn't, that's fine. He has the right to believe whatever he wants, okay? But this is just... This is just how I am, okay? And this feeds back into, you know, being yourself on YouTube. This is me, okay? And if that's if it's not okay to be me, then maybe YouTube shouldn't have the slogan broadcast yourself. You know what I mean? Cuz just because somebody is themselves on YouTube, that does, does, doesn't automatically make that an awesome thing. Cuz people, individuals are forces to be reckoned with, you know? They've got bad things and good things about them. There's good and evil in everybody. Anyway, let's, uh, all right, let me just finish skimming this email. I, I think I hit everything. So I just, I read that email. I thought it was really cool. This guy disagreed with me, but then he changed his mind and he emailed me. Even, even if he didn't change his mind about disagreeing with me, I would still respect him for sending me a very thoughtful and respectful email. So I don't know if you're here. I'm not going to say your name, but if you know who you are, if you're the guy who wrote this email and you're here in the chat right now. Thank you for taking the time to write such a thoughtful email to me. And I'm sorry if I offended you. I really am because that's never my intention to offend somebody. I know I deal with controversial subjects, but my aim is to make people laugh and make people think, you know, and, you know, think critically about their own positions and their own ideals that they hold maybe you know but for the most part i just try to entertain or make people laugh but um thank you for doing that and i encourage more of this if you disagree with anything that i've said please send me an email i will read it and if if i might even read it out i mean not that i want to be selective about the emails that i get it's just that I just thought this one was just so finely worded in particular that I thought it was worthwhile to point this out in the podcast, you know, but if you send me an email and you disagree with me, I will very, I would very much like to read it. And I am open minded. I am willing to have my ideas challenged. I'm even willing to change my mind on things. But as long as you have facts or evidence to back up what you're saying, that's, that's all, you know. So there you go. That's that email. That's my thoughts on that that survey that I got. Um, I know I'm an edgelord. I get it. But I gravitate towards these things because I think they're worth talking and joking about. And uh, I'm just doing what I think's right, what I think's funny. And um, I don't know what else to do other than that. You know what I mean? I don't want to stray from taboo subjects just because, like, ugh. I don't want to I think I think comedy comes from not a big part of comedy comes from not playing it safe you know and being willing to tackle subjects that make people feel uncomfortable and I make these jokes because I want this polarization to go the fuck away I want people to get along like they did back in the 90s things maybe I'm oversimplifying things maybe it was just because I was a kid but you know things seem to be so much simpler back in the day I don't know what the fuck happened. I guess, you know, technology plays a big part of that. You know, the presence of the internet, the fact that the entire world is globally connected in an instant. You know, any news story from any corner of the world can be instantly relayed to everybody on the planet simultaneously. And then what are the manifestations of that? What are the effects of that on society? What does that do to people's tempers? Like what, how... How does that increase the divisiveness of people in terms of what they believe? And I want to see people get along. That's what I want. I can tell you that for a fucking fact. I don't want to see people fighting. I don't want to see people upset. I want to see everyone getting along, being happy, being comfortable in their own skin, finding meaning in their lives. I don't want polarization. I don't want fighting. I don't want argument. Even though I write a show about toys constantly arguing, but it's just a show, you know, and it's funny. So that's why I do it. 
I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Should we do some super chats? Thank you for listening, by the way. I probably wore out your patience. There's some people in the chat who are like, you're still going. Yeah. Okay. I get it. This is my podcast. Okay. I'm going to fucking ramble, but like, thank you. Even, even the people who are supporting me, I probably maybe rambled on a little too much, even for them. But I just want to let you know that I very much appreciate you listening to me say all that. And if I'm going to be accused of being unfair or cultivating a hateful group of people, I want to be able to defend myself, you know? And it's just, I really felt like that's not true. I got to, I want to, I want to clarify this for anyone, even if they don't believe it, but they're just kind of not sure. It's like, here's my position. Let me just fucking lay it out. You know, here's what I think. So there you go. All right, let's do super chats. I'm sorry I droned on for so long. Thank you for listening. Um, where is my chat page? Street viewer activity. Here we go. Oh, that's weird. It's not listing anything. I'll just refresh the page. Hang on. All right, there they are. Poglins for life for one ninety nine says, "Ooh woo, I simp for you, Daddy John." I finally get that ooh woo thing. It's like the anime eyes with like the little cute hamster mouth that goes like that goes up and down and up. I get it now. I'm in on the joke. I'm down with the homies. <laughs> I'm down with the kids. <clears throat> the kid lingo. Thanks, Poglins. Jebediah Kerbal says, for £1.99, says, PM podcast equals postmodernism podcast job. Love you. Oh, well, I must have satisfied those that particular uh, audience, the, the old postmodernism audience. I'm sure they were delighted by this podcast. Thanks, man. Andy Berryman for 20 pounds. Holy moly. Says, John, I was going to use this money for e-thoughts, but you give me an even bigger hard-on. Simp for John. Get it trending. XXX. Oh, thank you, Andy. Yes, simp for me. Simp. My beautiful army of simps. Um, yeah, that whole e-thought thing is pretty funny. I'm jealous. These, these women on Twitch and YouTube who make fucking bank, man. And they sell their bath water. Can you imagine if I sold my bath water? It just wouldn't work, would it? Hey, don't forget to buy your John CJG bath water. Actually, I take that back. Maybe that would sell really well. That's it. It's going to be a product on my website. John Graham's bath water, everybody. Delicious. <laughs> what do you do with bath water? Do you drink it? Do you pour it into a bath and bathe in it yourself? Like, what do you do with it? You just have it there in the container? Do you just sniff it? <laughs> What are you supposed to do? Inject it. Oh, of course. Yes. Intravenously. Oh, Belle De Delphine bathwater. Give me more. Oh, Belle. I can feel you inside me. <laughs> I can feel your stank coursing through my veins. Oh, Jesus Christ. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate it, man. Kiro for five bucks says, Hi, John. Been watching you since my people bombed Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Keep it up, buddy. Body. Keep it up, body. Why did you personally bomb Pearl Harbor, Kiro? I want to know that. Why did you slip on the goggles, climb into the bomber jet? Why did you take off from, from that runway? 
What made you pull that lever to let the bomb go? Why did you laugh hysterically as you did it? <laughs> Why, Kiro? Couldn't you just leave Pearl Harbor alone? Anyway. Thanks, Kiro. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Dave B. for two, $2 says, Been watching you since Stephen Harper was PM. That was a while ago. I always thought Stephen Harper looked like a Lego man. Like his hair. I always thought you could take his hair and just pop it off like a Lego guy. He would just have a little stump there at the top. Thanks, Dave. Slider Turtle for five bucks says, Hey, John, what did you think of the Sonic movie? Also, how are your death camps coming along? Oh, construction is coming along great. My bit, my death camps will be best death camps in history. I guarantee it. Um, what did I think of the Sonic movie? Okay. I'm going to have to f remember the... Are you guys ready for my Sonic review? Is this okay to go into this? It better be. I hope it's okay. I, I want to do my... I guess I'll do my Sonic review now. I'm not quite prepared for it. I wrote a bunch of stuff down, but it's been a while since I did, so I'm going to have to remember. But I think I can remember everything well enough. Okay, so... I won't. I won't linger on this too long, okay? But... I thought I would hate it. I didn't hate it. I thought it was actually... I won't say good, but it was okay. I thought it was pretty okay. In terms of a kid's movie, I thought it was actually pretty decent. Um, it started exactly, pretty much exactly how I thought it would. With the stereotypical Fred Savage style Sonic the Hedgehog like narration intro where it's like hey i'm sonic the hedgehog that's not me that's me over there it's a great it's a great life down here in green hill zone i gotta run around and blah 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 like that's exactly what i expected and that's what i got it was it wasn't it didn't do the that's not me that's me it didn't do that but it did do that like that narration where i was just this is what they're going to do. It, it actually started in media res where it started like three quarters through the movie. And then it kind of does this rewind thing, which I thought was a little questionable. But I was like, okay, fine. Like, because in the process of rewinding, cause it starts in the middle of combat between Sonic and Robotnik, right? This is the beginning of the movie. I don't think I'm spoiling anything. And uh, it's it does that thing where it's like, Let's go back a little bit in time. And then it goes, does that. And it rewinds the feed. And in that rewinding process, you see fragments of the whole movie play, playing out. And I was just like, I don't know if that's like a. I would prefer if the movie didn't do that. And it just started with Sonic and Green Hill Zone. But whatever. It's not a big deal. And then. Um, Sonic's running around and then it like adds this new lore that I've never seen in like the cartoons or the comics or the games or anything where it's like there's this owl character. She's like the mother of all animals and like he, Sonic's one of the animals. And he has this bag of rings and the rings are all individually. They're, they can all be used as portals to other places, which is... It's like, okay, they're taking this special ring idea from the games where you go to a special stage and they're incorporating that into the movie's plot where it transports you to other parts in or on Earth. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And then um, I liked Sonic's redesign. I mean, that, that first design, holy fucking shit, what were they thinking? Like, I got a real bad vibe when I first saw that. And the like the initial posters, or I was just like, "What is this gonna look like?" And then the first trailer came out, and everyone was like, "Holy shit!" Like that looks so dumb. It not just dumb; it looks like creepy. He's got like realistic 
like muscle contour in his legs and it's like he's got real human teeth and uh oh it was just uh, it was just didn't it didn't work and it's hard to imagine what made them over at the studio think that that did work and it made me lose a lot of faith just on that redesign alone i was just like fuck if they think that's a good idea what else do they think is a good idea that's actually not <laughs> you know but i got to give them credit they they took all the fan feedback they said okay we hear you we'll fix it and they they tragically the 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 studio they redesigned the character they finished the movie and then I th I heard that the the cam the whole company went under, like every all the st the staff was fired and it was dissolved, which I thought was a real shame. I thought, well, they screwed up with that initial redesign, but fuck, they didn't deserve that. I didn't I didn't want them to go under as a company and lose all their finance. Like, I don't know. If I need to confirm that. I just I remember reading an article where that like, that company went under after right after the redesign. But anyway, I thought they did a really good job redesigning the character. I still don't know how I feel about, like, the character having fur. But this, that goes to a greater problem, or, like, a I wouldn't say a problem, but a debate of whether or not the character should ever be rendered in a live-action context. You know what I mean? Because when when you when you bring a character like Sonic into a live action world, then you're forced to ask questions such as, does he have fur? Like, does he have actual quills? Like those, when Sonic has one of those spikes on the back of his head, is that all one quill, or is that a com a conglomeration of a bunch of tiny quills that you can't see the detail of because it's just like a two D animated sketch of the character and that those details don't really matter so if you're doing like a 2d animated film of sonic you don't really have to pay attention to those details but all of a sudden when you're doing a real live action rendition you have to actually ask those questions so john what the fuck you t what's the confusion here well, john what the fuck you talking about john stop it please I'm doing a Sonic review, okay? I'm sorry if that's just earth-shatteringly inappropriate for you guys, but, like, fuck. If you don't want to listen to this, you can navigate to something else on YouTube or... Jesus Christ. Do you not understand what I'm saying? Like, if you look at a 2D representation of Sonic, right? The, he's got three big spikes in the back of his fucking head, okay? And so you can either interpret that thing as one big quill or... A, a bunch of tiny quills all bundled together into one big one. And I'm just saying, when you bring the character into live action, all of a sudden you have to ask those questions and come to a decision about the design elements. Where it's like, okay, do we do a bunch of little quills? That ended up being a significant plot element because there's a single quill that falls off of Sonic that Robotnik uses to power some machinery or something. So... But I was okay with that, actually. I didn't know how I felt about the quills at first, but I was just like, okay, he looks... The design looks okay. I actually like the redesign. Like, if you're going to do Sonic live action, I thought that was perfectly acceptable. I, that redesign. Not the initial one, but the redesign I thought was perfectly acceptable. That was, that was fine. And I actually... I liked the character. I thought the voiceover was pretty good. I thought... I just... I liked the character in general. It's not what I wanted from a Sonic the Hedgehog movie, but I thought James Marsden was okay. I thought there was some some stiff cardboard acting, like the James Marsden and his black girlfriend. Like I got no problem with a mixed relationship on film. Okay, that's totally fine, obviously. But the problem is that there was no chemistry between those two actors. I didn't believe that they loved each other. They didn't even kiss each other. They had this like awkward hug at the end of the movie when they should have like made out or something, but then they didn't want to, I guess, because they they weren't comfortable with each other as actors. I don't know 
what it was, but they just decided to hug at the end. And I was just like, Ugh. I feel like behind the camera, these actors don't probably don't like each other, <laughs> you know, and they're just going through the motions. They're just, yeah. I don't, Cause you never know in filmmaking when actors have like beefs with each other off camera, Sometimes they're not professional about it on camera and that kind of seeps into the performance where it's just like, oh, I don't like this guy or I don't like this girl. Maybe there was a kiss written into the script, but they decided it wasn't, they didn't want to do that for whatever reason. I don't know what it was. It just felt awkward that they didn't kiss. I don't know. It's just, it was just a hug. I was like, I'm supposed to believe that they're getting, they're married or they're getting married or whatever. I don't remember what the relationship was, but. But anyway, I kind of object to the premise of the live action movie because I, I made this joke before, but I just I kind of got this Adam Sandler movie impression from it where it's like James Marsden is a small town cop and his world was turned upside down when a special blue hedgehog entered his life and it changed his life in a way that he's never gonna forget. This summer, James Marsden is gonna realize that being a hedgehog isn't as easy as it looks. Blah, 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 blah. I kind of got that vibe. And... I can, the movie did play out in a way where uh, it was kind of eye rolling where like what I want from a Sonic movie is like something that takes place on in Green Hill Zone or Angel Island or like the Sonic universe you know I don't I don't just want it to be Sonic goes through a portal and he he's in the city he's in the real city and he's interacting with real people and blah 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 <laughs> Rob Schneider is a carrot <laughs> I wanted a Sonic movie to just be like I could even picture a Sonic movie as being like a silent film where it's just like all atmosphere and visuals only and if you if the, the parts of the movie were all stages from the games like like uh Collision Chaos from Sonic CD or like I don't know like Angel Island from Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Sonic 3 or Mushroom Hill Zone I mean Sonic Mushroom Hill Zone was actually in the movie but it was like rendered in this kind of like realistic way it was kind of weird um wasn't what I was looking for from a Sonic movie but for what it is, I thought it was actually pretty competently put together. There's a joke in it that involves the Sonic the Hedgehog drawing. Like, you know the stupid kid's drawing of Sonic where he's got a big circular body and a stupid head and a face and his his, his arms are kind of like <laughs> like this. It look like it's Sonic. If you type in Sonic in Google, you'll find it like page 1. Um, the movie uses that and it uses it in a really clever way where I actually laughed. I was like, that's, I was, I was blown away. I was like, wow, that's actually funny. That's a clever way of, of incorporating that joke. I liked that the movie did that. And there was this kind of emotional arc with Sonic the Hedgehog having no friends. Like he, like he goes to earth because he's fleeing danger. And he's doing what he's told because the Mother Owl character told him to do this thing. And he's been on Earth all this time and he has no friends and he's grown up. And he's like, he's he's observed the humans and he's learned from them, but he doesn't mingle with them. So, so there was this slightly affecting emotional arc of him not having any friends. And then he finally makes a friend because he reveals himself to James Marden accident, Marsden accidentally. But these there's these stupid plot contrived plot elements where he's got his bag of ring I'm going into some spoiler territory, okay? I hope you don't mind. But he's got his bag of rings, right? This is the moment where James Marsden finds Sonic hiding in his shed. It was in the trailer, okay? 
and he's got his bag of rings and he pulls a ring out and just for the sake of the plot James Mardis, Marsden is wearing a shirt that says I love San Francisco or something like that and Sonic's reading the sh he gets hit with a tran tranquilizer dart and he's reading his sh the shirt and as he's like falling asleep he kind of mutters San Francisco just because it's the last thing he sees I guess is the reason he's reading his shirt out loud but it's what he says that makes the ring that he drops out of his hand become a portal to San Francisco and then the ba his bag of rings falls into the portal and lands in the top of a building near San Francisco and I'm thinking about the logic of that where it's like how how was the X and Y coordinate and the Z coordinate for that ring determined just by him saying San Francisco like it just coincidentally manifested at the top of the tallest building in San Francisco like that that's stupid and it's like why why would Sonic read out what's on the guy's shirt just because he got hit, hit with a tranquilizer dart why would he be motivated to read out what's on his fucking shirt so that was obviously a thing the screenwriter decided was a good idea because it was necessary for the plot to happen. It's just like, well, we want to have a set piece in San Francisco, so I'll just type this stupid fucking thing so they eventually have to go to San Francisco. Yeah, it's a kid's movie, I know. Yeah, whatever, I get it. You can, have, you can make a kid's movie but not have stupid plot shit like that. You can have a smart plot in a kid's movie. Anyway, so there's this, like, there's this s side character comedic relief with, like, like, James Marsden is in this relationship with this black chick, and she has, like, black family members, and her, the girl's sister is, like, this obese com comedic relief black woman. I don't want to, I don't say obese to be mean. I'm just saying she's, she's heavy, okay? But I think she was chosen specifically because of that physical trait. She's, like, the... Comic relief, heavy set black woman who says things like, oh, hell no. <laughs> I mean, she is kind of literally that, where she's just kind of. She's. Her role in the movie is to be alarmed by the plot and the, dis the main character's decisions and, like, the, the, the Sonic's decisions. And it's just like, you're going to do what? That's crazy. You crazy. And she's angry at her sister for being in a relationship with this guy who she deems is not a fit partner for her or whatever. I don't know. But I was just looking at... It was kind of funny, but I'm just like, this isn't what I want from a Sonic movie. You know what I mean? Like, the, I mean, comedy for sure. But like a, a sassy black woman that's not integral to the main plot and like, did we really need to explore the relationship dynamic between James Marsden and his wife like and their families I don't know it's it was it was fine it's just definitely not the direction I would have gone in for like a sonic movie um anyway I would I would love to write a sonic movie by the way but the f the first I actually I wrote a spec script for a Sonic the Hedgehog short film, I think, but it sucked, so I I scrapped it. <laughs> so it's not an easy thing to make a Sonic movie, but if I were to make a Sonic movie, that would not be the direction I would go in. But anyway, um, I I'm much more interested in the relationship between Sonic and Robotnik. Which, by the way, I forgot to mention Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey is really good in this movie, but he's like so he's so extra he's extra af because he's jim carrey and he's got to be crazy he's got to say and do crazy things all the time and there's some cringy dialogue in his first scene like when robotnik's first introduced he's talking to like this military colonel guy and he's just like what's your name and the general's like trying to say his name but it, robotnik keeps interrupting them he's like what was that and he keeps trying to say his name. He's like, what? What? Oh, I know what your name is. I don't care. Or something like that. And it's like, I thought that was it's kind of funny, I guess. But it just kind of, 
I thought it was pretty eye rolling to be honest. And then there's that dumb joke about like this was in the trailer where Sonic gets smuggled in James Marsden's gym bag and he's like, it smells like ham sandwiches in here. I talked about this before, but I'll say it again. It's just like, is that a joke? Like, if you're going to the gym, if you're going to the gym to work out, you're probably going to want to bring a packed lunch with you. You know, maybe you're not going to head home right away. Maybe you want to eat at the gym or something, in which case it's perfectly reasonable to take a lunch with you in the same bag. So is the fact that the bag smells like ham sandwiches a joke? Like, I don't really see why that's... Why am I supposed to laugh? There's a bunch of jokes like that where it's just like, is that... I, that seems to be intended as a joke, but I don't really see how it's fucking... <laughs> ham sandwiches! <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not exactly in tears falling out of my cinema chair, you know what I mean? Anyway, weak joke, but it's not a it's not a big deal. Um, st I think st structurally overall, I think the 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 film worked pretty well. So there's that. Um, but yeah, a bunch of eye rolling jokes, but some jokes that worked pretty well, like the Sonic joke. There's a joke where Sonic is reading Flash, like the comics. And it's mildly funny, but it's like, okay, it's not that funny. It's like, it's like, uh, oh, Flash runs fast. Sonic runs fast. They both run fast. <laughs> that's, that's the joke. It's like, okay, I'm supposed to laugh at that, I guess. It's kind of funny, I guess, but like I wanted... I want funnier stuff than that. If you're going to give me comedic material, it's like, come on, give, make me laugh. Do something not raunchy because it's a kid's movie, but like I think you can be funnier than that while still keeping it a kid's movie. You know what I mean? Anyway, so um, the characters go on this road trip where they find like the largest ball of elastic bands or something. And I'm just like, what is this? What? Why why is this in the movie? <laughs> why is this in the movie? <laughs> These stupid like I mean, it w was it just in service of that joke where Sonic zips out of the car and then he's back in again cuz punchline, he's fast. That's the joke again. It's like, okay. Funny, kind of funny, I guess, but like um there was a good bit in the there's like a scene in a bar where it goes like super slow motion, but Sonic is moving at normal speed because he's super fast, right? So he's kind of doing all these things to all these people in the bar during a bar fight while they're all fro relatively frozen in time. They're moving like super slowly. It's relative to him, right? And uh, I thought that, that was actually, that was pretty cool. I like that scene. There was a few scenes where I, it was like a mixed bag where I was just like, that joke sucked. But then there would be a scene where I was like, where I'd be like, oh, that's pretty clever. I like that. And then it kind of, it gets to the climax where they go to San Francisco because that's where they end up because of that stupid plot thing in the beginning that I mentioned with the t-shirt. And then uh, there's a fight with Robotnik and that was okay, I guess. And it had kind of a, a sweet ending where Sonic finds a home. You know, he's ma he makes friends, he has a family, he has a home. And I'm like, oh, there's there's actually an arc here. You know, the character was in one emotional space and now he got what he wanted through f by facing adversity. He eventually got what he wanted. And that's that's a nice that's a pretty nice ending. And then I won't spoil it, but there's an after credits thing that I thought was pretty cool. Even though it's like, it introduces a character that wasn't in the movie at any other point. And I was just like, why is this character only showing up now? But nonetheless, it was a good after credits scene. And by the time, oh yeah, also the, the credits themselves. 
it's cool because the first part of the end credits are done with like Genesis graphics. So it's like the old Sonic games as the end credits are playing. But it's like elements from the movie done in Genesis artwork, like 16 bit. And I was like, that's fucking cool. I like that. And so by the end of the movie, I was smiling. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think the movie was great. It was good at best. Okay at worst, I would say. Um, but by the end of it, I had a smile on my face. And I was like, you know what? That wasn't that bad. And I'm sure a kid would love that movie. And that's my Sonic the Hedgehog movie review. So I would say it's worth a watch. If you're a Sonic, if you're a retro Sonic fan or even a modern Sonic fan and you're, you're curious about the movie, you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend giving it a watch if you're a fan. Or if you're not a fan, you might just enjoy it purely as a kids movie. I think it's a it's a it's a very serviceable kids movie. It's it's good. It's pretty good. No. <laughs> it's it's okay, between okay and it's good. I'll say it's good, okay? It was all right. It was it wasn't the movie I wanted, but it was okay. Okay, that's my Sonic movie review. I wanted to keep it briefer than that, but what can I say? This is just the way I... This is how I operate. You know what? You can either stay on this train or jump off, but this is the train, you know? You gotta you gotta put up with me, okay? So I might go on in more detail than you care for, but... I got to follow where my brain goes because I don't have the discipline to keep things shorter than they should be. Okay. So I hope that was okay. So I hope you enjoyed my Sonic movie review. Let's move on with the super chats. Okay. So here we go. That was from slider turtle. Thank you, man. I hope you enjoyed that. Gustavo Perez for four ninety nine says your early content Got me through stuff that I never would have without your entertainment, man. Make stuff that fulfills you, not the world. Thanks, dude. That means a lot. Um, Yeah. I mean, you want to make your audience happy. But um, when it comes to making good content, I think you have to not think about everyone else and focus on what makes you amused or like entertained or whatever you think is funny. You know what I mean? Cause that's your best bet for entertaining the maximum amount of your fans. I think it's just being true to yourself and your own sense of your own sensibilities. You know, am I, la do I find this funny? Okay. Well, most viewers will probably think the same, but you're always, you're not always going to hit the mark, you know, but you do your best. That's what I try to do. Anyway, I'm I'm happy you enjoy the show, man. Thank you for that. James R for ten bucks says you are one of the few YouTubers that are still producing content with actual depth. Everyone else is just a vlogger. I hope the market swings your way again eventually. Thanks, man. I hope so too. I mean, yeah, everyone everyone else is just a vlogger. What does that say about vlogging? What do people vlog about? I mean, if God, if they're not themselves, if they don't talk about anything interesting or remotely controversial, what is a vlog? What does it consist of? What do these What do these people consider entertaining? Hey, I had lunch today. I Instagrammed it. It was great. It was delicious. I went for a walk and I saw a squirrel. <laughs> And then I went home and I I, I played the latest vi AAA video game. And I have no opinion of it because I don't want to lose my sponsorship. <laughs> or, like, I, I have no criticism. I just think it was great. By the way, this vlog is brought to you by Rage Shadow Legends or whatever the fuck it's called. <laughs> Rage Shadow Legends, is that the name? Whatever the fucking thing is. Ugh. Hey guys, so I just woke up and oh boy, you won't believe what happened. Yeah. 
I hate that shit. That's so dull. I want to watch a YouTuber and I want to be alarmed. You know what I mean? I want someone to shock me. Like, give me the worst you got. You know what I mean? Let me know what you... As long as it's like you're not bullshitting me, you're not lying to me, I don't care what your beliefs are. Give it to me. Let me hear it. Give me the worst you got. Let me, let's me. let see. Let's hear it. And it's like, do I agree with it? Do I not? Leave it up to me and I'll, I'll decide for myself. But I do want to hear from everybody. I, and no matter how bad it is. Anyway. Thank you, James. Played in the background for $2 says, what type of woman do you like? Um, I'm a breast man for sure. I don't mean to objectify women. Sorry, ladies, but it's true. I am a breast man. Um, asses are a factor, but I do prefer breasts over ass. That is a commonly asked question. Are you a breast man or an ass man? I, if I had to, if I had a gun to my head, I said, John, you have to make a choice. Do you prefer breasts or do you prefer ass? I'd have to say breasts. But um, that's not to say personality does not play a factor. Of course it does. I don't want to spend the rest of my life with somebody with a shitty personality. Of course not. Tits aren't enough. Tits are great. But tits alone? No. It's got to be the whole package. Not saying you have to have big, huge tits or a big ass. But, you know... A little something there helps. And a personality to boot. And uh, that would suit me just fine. But then, like I said before, I'm a, U I'm a YouTuber fucking shitlord. And I take risks that are... I, I make jokes that are of financial risk to me. And jokes that I would probably be far less likely to make if I had a family to support. So... I probably won't get involved any anyway, not for not for some considerable period of time anyway, because I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. I don't know. We'll have to see. But um, I don't have high hopes. I'll say that much. John likes fat chicks. <laughs> How did you get that from what I just said? Oh, from my prom story, probably. Hey, I don't discriminate. If you got a strong enough personality, if you're not fucking full of shit, you know, I'll consider anybody. Regardless of body weight or breasts or ass or whatever. But I don't want to be dishonest and say none of those are a factor. Obviously, there's a physio physiological factor for both men and women when it comes to um, human attraction. Anyone who claims the opposite is lying to you. Anyway. There you go. Played in the background. I hope you like that um, abundance of detail. <laughs> uh, moving on here. Slendy for five pounds says, John, you are someone who has brought a lot of joy to me and you are genuinely someone helping me get through bad stuff in life. Your streams are the best. All this dick sucking. I'm just kidding. I'm not shitting on you, but um, I just imagine some people in the in the chat are just like, "What? What? Wh what is this?" The John reads compliments about himself. The show. Hey John, you're so great. Oh thanks. Hey John, you're super awesome. Oh thank you. Hey John, you're the best guy ever. You're the best person who's ever lived in history. Thanks. Okay, that's the show, everybody. Good night. I don't want the show to be just that. But there are a lot of compliments, but I do appreciate them all. I hope people don't mind that I'm constantly reading out compliments as if I'm this fucking great guy. But what can I say? I am a great guy. I'm basically Jesus Christ. I don't want to sound like a... D I don't want to sound egotistical or anything, but I am basically the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I am Jesus Christ in in 
this perfect Adonis body. <laughs> the the perfect genetic specimen. <laughs> oh fuck me. All right. Thanks, Slendy. I really appreciate it, man. I'm glad you enjoy the show. And I'm sorry about the bad stuff in your life. We all got bad stuff in our lives. You're not alone. Everyone's in the same fucking depressing boat full of fucking holes. I'm glad I could be a cork in one of those holes filling your boat with water. Thanks, man. Brett says, have you read Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life? Um, it's my roommate's copy. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but um, I'm part way through it. So I haven't actually picked it up in a while. I've been meaning to. I've just I've got too much shit to do. I've always got something to edit, whether it's episode 15 or a bite I'm, epi- I'm working on that month or the podcast footage or my other job, uh, my other editing job. Like, I've always got something to do, and it's just like, I do find time for video games to keep me sane, but, you know, when I do have free time, it's like, do I want to read books, or do I want to play video games? I know, I'll play video games. (laughs) That's what I end up doing. But I've I've actually been playing um, FF7, not the remake, but the original. I got the the re... Fuck, I don't want to say remastered. Not the remake, but, like, the original PlayStation 1 version ported to the Nintendo Switch. I guess, is that a remastered version? I guess. Because there's a difference between remastered and remake, right? So I've been playing the original FF7 on my Switch. With all the fucking loser cheats on. With, like, three times speed, no random encounters, and, like, regenerating health and all that. I just wanted to blast through the story because I wanted to like I knew the story was really good but I didn't know what the story was so I wanted to absorb it all I like I had beaten it in the past but I forgot the whole story so I wanted to re-ingest the whole story again and it's it's good shit that's a fucking great campaign anyway John please for God's sake what what did I do I feel like I'm on these like perfectly legitimate rants or discussions, but then it, like I read some fucking thing in the chat out of the corner of my eye and it's like I'm fucking up. I don't know what I did. John, please, for God's sake. What did I do? Oh, John, we need to know. Oh, he's referencing something he wrote. Is the roommate a hot girl? No. He's a man. He's a big, gross, hairy man, okay? completely different from the hot Russian model who's just always just off camera to my left here and is very, very naked and is spreading her pussy apart. What's, what's a, what's a female Russian name? Like a tip, like a typical Russian woman name. I don't know. Natalia. I'm thinking of that chick from Goldeneye. Natalia, put your pussy away. When's the last time you washed that thing? Get in the shower. (laughs) Svetlana, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, aside from her, she's not the roommate I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about um, my male roommate who I live with who who not only recommended 12 rules rules for life or gave it to me to read he also said i should play ff7 again but yeah i've been really enjoying ff7 and um i'm at sephiroth but i haven't beaten sephiroth yet i i tried once and i i i fucked it up even with the cheats on can you fucking believe that because Sephiroth, the final boss, he casts all these fucking bullshit spells. Like, you get all these status... What do you call them? Like, uh, status effects. Like, he puts small and frog on you. Like, that means you're small. You only do, like, one hit point of damage. And then if you're a frog, 
it's the same thing. And you got to have like all those items to cure those things or you're fucked. Yeah. So like I, I messed up and I didn't buy enough shit from the stores. So, so I got to do that and I got to level up a bit. Supernova effects. Yeah. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys, you guys are gamers. Are you guys gamers like me? Are you hardcore gamers? I play FF7 from PS1. That's how hardcore I am, you guys. But yeah, it's, it's a it's a great story about um what what constitutes a human being, you know? Is it our actions? Is it our memories? If those memories are corrupt or false, does that mean your character is lessened by anything? And I think the moral of the story is that ultimately, ultimately it's actions that define character. And Cloud obviously ends up saving the day in the end. So there's a really nice um, arc. Then there's a nice thematic in that game. It's a, it's a long fucking game, but it's like, it's good. It's good shit. Clyde Strafe, yes. In case you wanted to know exactly how the main character's name is pronounced, it's Clyde Strafe. Chad Strife. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right, let's move on here. Um, thanks, Brett. Chernobyl Pwn says, will racist make another appearance? Uh, I think so. I was actually inspired, you know, ever since since that Patreon survey, I was actually inspired to make a bite that's like about politics. Bear with me, but making fun of politics. So I would have, I haven't fleshed this out nearly enough, but the basic idea that I had was that the, the toys are questioning, questioning their own politics. And then they watch YouTube f for, like, information on politics. And what they watch on YouTube is me playing a guy who's, like, a news anchor. Who's, like, something middleman. I don't know, I don't know the first name, but I figured out I want the last name to be middleman. And I want him to be... An ab like a like a satirical representation of a centrist who thinks it's wrong to e to navigate either left or right on any issue, like he just wants to play it exactly down the middle on everything, and obviously that's not the right way to like conduct yourself. So he would be something middleman. I haven't figured that out yet. And then he would have two guests on. One of the guests would be racist who's meant to be the rational spokesman of the right. And then another character I haven't come up with yet, who would be the rational representation of the left. And so the, the joke is that none of the three people are right. You have this leftist extremist who's wrong. You have this adamant centrist who's wrong. And then you have this guy on the right who's this ridiculous racist who's also obviously wrong. And so the, the joke would be I mean, the message of it would be that the right answer to things is as a kind of winding path in the middle of the spectrum. It's not strictly on the middle. It's not strictly on the left. It's not strictly on the right. But I would play out that three-way interaction. Like racist would be saying all this horrendously racist, offensive shit. The, the left guy would be going on about like no borders, abolish ICE, welcome everybody, like there's no such thing as evil people and like all immigrants are good and just like just all the left leaning stuff to the extreme and then you'd have this centrist guy who refuses to take any action on the left or the right and the joke is that they're all wrong so that's an idea that i have but i haven't fleshed it out yet and i'm not confirming that as a bite i'm just saying that's one of my ideas that i have so there you go are people mad at John right now? Why would anyone... Have I said it? Have I said something offensive? I don't think I have. I think that's a good idea. 
But just because it's politics, it's a bad idea. I don't know. Fuck, whatever. Maybe I won't do it then. I have this other idea, too. Like, uh, I want to do an episode. I want to do a trans episode. I want to do where an episode where Chief, he sees how much money women are making on Twitch. And then he decides to become a woman just so he can make money. And then, but in in doing that bite, because trans is such a hot is such a charged issue I don't want to be fucking flagged or whatever because of hate speech just because I'm dabbling in this theme of trans and like I'm not a trans person so someone might say to me well y your opinion isn't valid because you're not a trans person you don't know what the experience of a trans person is like and so like I don't know I think it's really funny and I feel like I could do it in an inoffensive way, but I'm still kind of, because of the political climate, I'm just kind of apprehensive to it. John, you so easily give up on your ideas because someone complained. Yeah, I know, I know. You're right, you're right. I, I, I read that and I got angry, but you're right. Um, I'm too much of a bitch. I am too agreeable. One person complaining kind of throws me off course. But I'm just being honest. Like the based on the political climate, there's certain episodes like the trans thing where I feel like I might really piss people off if I do this. And you know what? I'm still prepared to do it. I just I have to be more careful in the way I write it because I want to make sure the joke is clear. What I'm attacking in that episode is people who are not actually trans, but they use that movement to further their own nefarious ends. So in Chief's case, he's only about he's only after money and he's staunchly heterosexual, but he's abusing the movement to get what he wants because he recognizes the trans thing as this bulletproof umbrella where if you just if you can just get under it, then you can get away with whatever it whatever it is you want. And that's what I'm making fun of. But that ha need, needs to be clear. And I wrote a first draft of it, and I read it, and I was like, you know what? I don't know if that intent is really clear, and I want to hold off on this bite until I can clarify this 100%. So it might still be a bite that I do down the line. I am still apprehensive, but I might still do it anyway if I can get the script to a point where I feel like I'm being as crystal clear about my intent as I can. Because I'm not out to alienate trans people or make them feel bad or whatever. I want, I I think it's I think it's terrible what trans people have to go through. You know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I certainly want to. I wouldn't want to be in that position where I don't feel comfortable in my own body, and I have to transition from one gender to another. That's a that's a very unsettling feeling, and it's it's excluding. It's I don't want anyone to be in a position where they feel ostracized from the group. I want everyone to feel welcome no matter what. Just don't be an asshole, you know? That's it. That's my only thing. Just don't be a dick and be the best person that you can be, whether you're man or woman or other or trans or whatever. Like, whatever. But the joke in that bite that I mentioned is people abusing the movement for monetary gain or attention or whatever their own personal obsession is. Whatever it is. I don't know. Anyway, there. Uh, that's my idea for for a bite that I might do later on. But I'm holding off on that one. I got other bites that I want to do before I get to that. So maybe one day. Anyway, uh, where were we? <coughs> Thanks, Chernobyl. Kirkland Signature for one ninety nine says... Watch oneself. Um, maybe we'll do that at, at the end of this. Maybe, I don't know, it's a little bit late. Maybe we'll save that for another day. I don't know. We'll see how I, I'll see how I feel by the end of this once we're through all the, the chats. And if, oh yeah, we still got to talk about The Last of Us. Um, let, let me just get through the chats and I'll talk about what I have left to talk about. And then maybe we'll do what another episode of oneself okay so 
We'll see. All right. Thanks, man. Um, surgery didn't work for $2. Says, do you have thick thighs? Um, I don't think so. I mean, they're not muscular. They have a bit of fat on them, but I don't know if they're thick. <laughs> with I don't know if they're thick with two C's anyway. Am I allowed to show that? I mean, what what where's the line between decency and indecency? Because there's there's restrictions on women now when they're streaming on YouTube or Twitch now. I think where it's like they can't show side boob, they can't show under boob. Uh, I think even cleavage periodly, cleavage period might not be allowed. Maybe they have to put a sweater on. Um, this is going to sound like I just want to see tits, but I don't agree with that. I feel like you should be able to just let women dress however the fuck they want. But then there's like the simping problem where it's like, okay, well, you're if you allow that, then you're going to have women who dress provocatively uh, because they know there's sips out there who are going to watch them and pay them money exclusively because they are scantily clad, you know? So what do you do? Do you tell people what to wear? I don't think that's the answer. I don't think you can draw a line there. I think that's... I think you just have to accept simps for... Simps, simps gonna simp. You know what I mean? Like, what can you do about it? I think any measures that you take to kind of stop that from happening is just, it's invasive. And women are just like, fuck off. Don't tell me how to dress. I'll dress however I want. I think it's on the, I think it's on the simps to have the discipline to be like, no, don't, don't, don't give your life savings to some chick just because like, you can kind of see her boobs <laughs> on camera. <laughs> it's ridiculous. These fucking simps in chats going, I just I just paid off your 10,000 house mortgage. Please be my friend. Please send nudes. Puzz. Puzz. Like that's on, that's, they're the problem. That's on them. They got to not be a fucking simp. But then there there are women out there who are quite happy to prey on that. So who's in the wrong? I don't know. That's a that's uh that's a tricky one. But I'm not prepared to tell anybody or pass legislation about what people can and can't wear in terms of clothing, you know? Job, can you make an OnlyFans? OnlyFans is for chicks, isn't it? I mean, are there guys on Only? I guess there's a there'd be a gay community on OnlyFans. I guess that's fine. But they're certainly not. I guess they could market to women. Yeah, I guess I will get an OnlyFans. Jo joined, and if you get my if you subscribe to my OnlyFans, you can see a lot more than this baby. <laughs> you can see all of my chest hair my gross European chest hair Look at, and my arm hair look at that you see that fucking line there god damn it that pisses me off I'm always, I'm always tempted to like shave that off because it just looks fucking stupid and gross I hate my disgusting body <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know, you guys. I just don't know. <clears throat> Do I have thick thighs? I don't know. Are they thick with two C's? I'm not sure. You'll just have to... Maybe one day you'll find out. I don't know. Thank you, surgery didn't work. Matthew Huff for four ninety nine says, "Hey John, I love Arby and the Chief in your podcast. Help me concentrate when I'm doing my sports writing. Thumbs up. Keep up the good work. Sports writing. That's interesting. Do you are you, do you write articles? You write like uh, like reviews of sports matches. I'm actually interested what that entails exactly. 
Because I always was kind of fascinated by the idea of having like a, a more straightforward writing job where I don't have to, f not like script writing where I have to figure out a whole plot and three act structure, but just like writing articles. But even even like that, I think there's a three act structure that you abide by, even if you're just writing an article. Essays are the same way, you know, because you have an intro, you have a body, and then you have a conclusion. You kind of treat it the same way. Um, that's cool, though, man. And uh, thank you. I will keep up the good work. Um, Adam K says... Hey, John, I understand from one of your hypermail videos you appear to be a fan of Breaking Bad. <laughs> Appeared to be a fan of Breaking Bad, as if the entirety of season six and seven wasn't a giveaway. If so, what do you think about Better Call Saul? I love uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. I think they're both fucking terrific shows. I was actually surprised by the last episode of Better Call Saul. Because I thought it was the, I thought it was the second last episode when it was actually the last episode. So when it ended, I was like, "Oh boy, I can't wait for the finale." And then I realized, like, "Oh, that was the finale." Fuck. Now I gotta wait for the fucking next season, which apparently is the final season. Season six is gonna be the last one, so I'm looking forward to it. Nothing happens the show. Oh, that's that meme is so annoying. I kind of get it. But not every episode of that show is Mike eats nuts for 40 minutes. Like <laughs> that's one of the jokes stemming off that meme. And it's like the show is not that. That's an exaggeration. The show does take its time. The show is character driven. It's not as fast paced as Breaking Bad. It doesn't unpack as much plot quite as fast as Breaking Bad does. But that doesn't mean it's poorly written. That doesn't mean it's not engaging. Better Call Saul is fucking terrific. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's great. Cinema, like, writing and cinematography, it's top notch. And the acting is terrific. And Lalo Salamanca is fucking awesome. I love that character. I love the actor that plays him. It's so good. Definitely check it out. Anyway, moving on here. Thank you, Matthew. Adam Case for five bucks says, Hey, John, I understand from one of your hypermail videos you appeared to be a... F oh, sorry, I just read that out. <laughs> Adam, I meant to say. Sorry, Adam. I've had a few. My bad. The Arbiter for ten bucks says, Love your stuff, my man. Been around for a bit. Blah, blah. Love you, baby. XOXO. Thanks, dude. Man, I, I got a lot of fans who've been around for a long time. That makes me feel good. You know, it's like, hey, I've been hanging out. I've been watching your shit since 2006, man. Or 2008 or whatever. Just late 2000s generally tends to be. Yeah, I saw El Camino. I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. A little bit slow, but worth it. Um, yeah, so I, I started my YouTube channel in 2006, I think, but I don't think I started Arby and the Chief until 2008. Was it 2008? You guys will probably have a better of I idea of this than I do. Um, I think 2006 is when I created my channel, but then, um, before I made Arby and the Chief, I would just upload random shit to my YouTube channel. Like, I used to make Halo 2 Machinima. Yeah, back in Halo 2 days, exactly. I used to make Halo 2 Machinima. One of my first videos I ever made was a video... Of, it was a movie... It was a short film called Mercenary. And it was just about one Spartan guy. This is all any Halo base, kids Halo Machinima is about, right? It's about a Spartan guy who has to make his way from the Zanzibar beach to the inside of the base and he has to kill a bunch of guys in the process and that that was the movie that was it and of course Halo 2 didn't have a theater mode so you had to use 
the camera had to be another player. But you couldn't get you couldn't remove the reticule, which was a problem. And back in the day, Halo Two I think was a four by three aspect ratio. It wasn't sixteen by nine. So it was lacking, let's say, in cine- cinematographic uh, sophistication. But um, I had a hell of a lot of fun doing it, even if working with the Pinnacle Studio hardware and software wasn't a joy. I did very much enjoy making those stupid movies. Halo 2 had widescreen support, did it? I can't remember. It was probably in that awkward phase where games had support for both, where it would ask you, like, what type of TV do you have? Now it's just standard, you know, 16 by 9. I remember with, like, Wind Waker and stuff, it would tell you, it would ask you, like, are you using a standard definition TV or do you want to enable widescreen progressive scan mode I think it was around that time anyway thank you the arbiter I really appreciate it man Eric Maitland for five bucks says howdy John catching you on my lunch break 950p you must be in Europe somewhere Catching you on my lunch break. Love the new bite. John, keep streaming. I just got accepted into the police academy, so I need you to watch. The police academy? (laughs) When I hear police academy, I just think of those movies. (laughs) You know? The ones the one that had like four at least four sequels. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Anyway. Um that's cool, man. Well done. Um, that's uh, that's not an easy position, law enforcement, for sure. So, well done. I'm glad you enjoyed the bite, dude. And stay safe out there. That's uh, it's a dangerous job. Certainly not easy. Mm. Anyway, thanks, dude. Jesse for five bucks doesn't say anything, but much appreciated. Thank you, Jesse. Canuck Kuhn says, Hey, John, black Canadian here, lol. Sensitivity comes in all colors. Comedy should never be censored. It's like a way of pointing out absurdity of life. Anyway, Toronto or Vancouver for film industry? Hey, thanks, man. And as a... as a, a, You said back Canadian, but I read that as black. But did you mean black or... Because back Canadian doesn't make sense. But in the context of your whole thing, you probably meant black. I'm going to assume you're black. In which case, I need an N-word pass. <laughs> oh, I think uh, I might have got one already. I saw kind of a glimpse of a super chat later on. that. Uh, I, n- I need every black man to send me a, a, an N-word pass. Please. It's for a good cause. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, sensitivity comes in all colors. Comedy should never be censored. I agree. As, like, uh, I'm a free speech advocate. I mean, in all aspects. But absolutely, when it comes to comedy, I think on a comedy stage, anything goes. You know? you gotta. I think you got to have the freedom to go anywhere. An audience should be willing to give the person who's on stage the license to go anywhere their mind takes them, even including uncomfortable territory. And... Uh, but you know, is is there a line you shouldn't cross? I mean, like this, then inevitably you come to that like Michael Richards example, you know, where he's in the fucking what was it the the place in L.A. was it the Comedy Store or something else? The Laugh Factory, I think it was the Laugh Factory, where he just says the N word over and over, and it's like, I mean, I'm a white guy, obviously, right? So I can never know what it's like to hear someone else say the N-word, right? And I'm sure there's some pain that comes along with being a black person and hearing that. And I'm not unsymp- and I'm not unsympathetic to that. Even if I'm a white guy, I can understand why that could be offensive, right? And in the case of Michael Richards saying that over and over, I think at that point you have to you have to examine like what what is his intent there? And um I don't think his intent was good 
maybe maybe it was benign. I'm not sure, but it certainly didn't sound good when he's just saying it over and over. And um but he he I think he did his he pay, he did his time for that. You know what I mean? Like he was hated for a long time and then people were just like eventually everyone was like, "Okay, we kind of forgive you now." And then it's just nobody just nobody talks about him anymore. And I think that's, I don't know. I think that's kind of a shame. You don't have to agree with me. Nobody has to agree with me. But I'm just like, you know, he he was on stage. I think he made a mistake. I don't think he's a hateful guy. I think he just, like, had the wrong idea of what was funny. And that's part of the gig, right? You take a risk. You Like, you decide what you think is funny, and then you, like, you throw, you throw some material out there and... I mean, personally, I wouldn't have done a bit like that because I I'm I like even just analyzing that on paper. I'm just like, this probably isn't going to go down well, you know, and I think Michael should have had the introspection to see like I should think twice about saying this on stage, you know, especially with all his time on Seinfeld where he's constantly on, on stage in front of people and like. But then that aspect of his personality was never really put to the test because he was always following a script and his comedy was always very particularly physical. He's, he was a slapstick comedian. His his inspiration was like Dick Van Dyke and stuff or Buster Keaton and like those physical comedians where you laugh because of the things they do, not because of the things they say. Then all of a sudden he's doing strictly verbal stand-up comedy and then he goes and does something like that and it's like it gets received very um i was gonna say ambivalent but no like i think pretty universally people disagreed or disapproved they're like just like dude that's not cool like it feels like you're it feels like you your intent is malicious but i don't i don't think he is a hateful racist guy at his core i think he just I think he made a bad call and he thought it would get more laughs. He tried to be edgy and he just kind of fell on his face. And I worry about that. You know, that's something I worry about. It's certainly something I don't think I'm immune to. Like there might come a day where I fucking, I say something on stream or I do something up in a bite or an episode of my show where it's like, I think it's funny. And then I put it out there and then they're like, Oh, people are like, Oh, that's, feels like it's in poor taste and then in retrospect i would go like oh you know what that that was probably too far maybe i should have thought that through more so i don't rule that out as ever being a possibility that might very well happen but i do try to be very careful to not ever fall into that trap you know what i mean so so yeah like uh but as as long as things are just words I don't know, like, there's something to be said for that, you know? As long as you're not getting violent. If something is just words, you can just get up and leave, you know what I mean? And, like I said, I think that guy, he served his time. You know, he was shunned in the public eye for a long time, and he just wants to get on with his life, and I don't think he's done anything to hurt anybody. So... Anyway, I I went on this whole tangent about Michael Richards. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to go on for so long, but I just, you know, I, it just seemed like organic territory to kind of migrate to. But anyway, I hope that was okay that I that I went there. And comedy should never be censored. I agree. Yeah. I think you it it is a risk. They might fall on their face, they might bomb, but you got to give the comedians the the ability to go anywhere you got to cede that territory it's just like okay you're the comedian you're on stage do whatever you're gonna do you know try and make me laugh maybe it won't work out well but it's up to you to navigate that you know what i mean that's i think that's the right way to do it um to, regarding toronto or vancouver for the film industry i can't really speak for toronto because i've barely spent any time in toronto the only time I've spent in Toronto is like brief, like waiting at the airport, which can hardly 
be considered as spending time in Toronto. Like, that's no experience of Toronto is sitting in the fucking airport. So, like, I can only speak of Vancouver. And in Vancouver, I mean, there's certainly no opportunities now, really, because of the fucking virus thing and the lockdown. But before the the virus, I would say Vancouver is a pretty good place to be for, like, in terms of television. Because there's a lot of stuff that's shot here. You know, f- um, whether it's local productions or U.S. productions that come to Canada, to Vancouver, to shoot because of the, of the tax breaks, it's ultimately cheaper for them to shoot here. So you get a bunch of, like, there's a bunch of, like, superhero shows that are shot here, you know, like Arrow and, like, fuck, what else? I can't remember. There's a bunch of, like, CW shows. Supernatural, that's another one that gets shot here. They all have, like, code names. So, like, or the the, the movies do, at least. Maybe not the TV shows. But, like, um... Yeah, there's a bunch there's a bunch of stuff that gets shot here. But funnily enough, like whenever there's a scene shot here in Vancouver, usually in the story it's established as not Vancouver. It's established as being in the states. So they'll they'll have like cop cars with like Seattle decals on them, you know? It's like like they want to suggest to their audience that oh, it's this isn't Canada, this is the United States. See, it says Seattle on the fucking cop car. It's like, well, what's what's the problem with having just Canadian RCMP? Why is that such a fucking... Does everything have to be in the fucking United States? I don't know, fuck. Um, Toronto, I know, has... There's a lot of... There's a bunch of stuff... Sh- I, there's some stuff shot in Toronto. I, I don't know how... In, I don't Relative to Vancouver, I don't know, like, how much... Or whether it's worthwhile going to Toronto over Vancouver or vice versa, but if you're in, if you're in film and you're looking for work, Vancouver, I can say, is probably not a bad bet. I mean, until this fucking virus thing is over, anyway, because that's throwing a real wrench in things, you know. I know I I have a bunch of actor friends or uh, people who work in the film industry as behind the camera, like crew members. Like grips or you know, wardrobe set deck, all that, where they they don't have any work right now because productions are being halted. So they're looking for for, uh, for they're looking for other sources of income in the meantime, and they don't know what to do. So it's tough. Anyway, people are saying in the chat that there's sound problems. What's what's the problem? I don't get it. Fix the fucking audio. Okay, well, how about you tell me what the fucking problem is? <laughs> no sound problems. Okay. So this is something that only some people are getting. So why just refresh your feed. Anyway, okay. Sound is fine for most people, apparently, so... Thank you, everyone. All the non-trolls. I appreciate you not trolling. All right, let's move on here. Uh, Where are we? Thanks, Canuck. Um, the guy who's who is Australian for 10 Aussie bucks says... I really hate the phrase Oscar snubs because it's used so much these days. There are a few I need to ask you about. Taxi tri- taxi driver losing best picture to Rocky. I assuming I'm assuming you've seen both. Thoughts. Yes, I have seen Taxi Driver and Rocky. Um, I'm aware that Rocky won the Oscar that year over Taxi Driver and I like I really like both movies. So I'm not that sore about Rocky winning best picture, although I think Taxi Driver probably should have gotten it. I think Taxi Driver was ultimately the better movie, but I think Rocky is a great movie. So 
I'm not. I'm just. I th- I think Taxi Driver should have won, but I'm just. I'm not that sore about it because I also really like Rocky. So maybe it should have gone to Taxi Driver, but it's not a big deal to me. So because Taxi Driver, I think, has a lot more depth to it. I think both movies have depth, but Taxi Driver goes deeper. Like the that the the character study in Taxi Driver is more fascinating. It's more it's more thought provoking overall. Rocky is just like it's just a satisfying movie, you know? And it's it I wouldn't say it's a shallow movie, but relative to Taxi Driver, it, I would say it's it's relatively shallow. But yeah, there's there's a bunch of years where the Oscars I think got it wrong, where it's just like, are you fucking serious that that movie won over that other movie? Like, give me a break. But uh, I watch the Oscars. Like I like seeing what wins, what doesn't win. I like the celebration of film. I like, you know, I just I enjoy the spectacle of it. I like that people care enough about cinema to like dish out awards. But like when it comes to the awards given at the end of the day, like whether I feel it's justified or not, I I might yell at the TV saying, what the fuck? But then I won't lose sleep over it. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just an award ceremony, whatever. Um, so yeah, I think recent in recent years, I've been watching the Oscars and I've been pretty on board with like the, the awards. Where I'm just like, you know what? That was a good movie. That should have won that award. Like, that makes sense. There's about, There's been a lot of cases of that happening. So, yeah. I like Taxi Driver. I like Rocky. It's not a big deal to me, personally. But I get your point. Like, because I'm assuming the way you've kind of phrased this, you think Taxi Driver should have won the Oscar, and I agree with you. Like, if we're talking about seriously about what's the better movie, then Taxi Driver, yeah. Anyway. Thanks, guy who's, who is Australian. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Brisk Hound says, Hey, John, quick question. Did you, did you a dolly zoom? I guess, did you do a dolly zoom in the latest bite? That was cool. Also, hi, missed you. Thanks, man. Uh, a dolly zoom in the latest bite. If I did, it would have been by hand. Like it wouldn't it wouldn't have been some kind of mechanical thing. I did actually get I got a Lego set with like a it was like a tractor thing for like a Lego set and it had this base where it had it was like a flat disc with wheels on it and I bought the Lego set just so I could have that one base piece so I could put the camcorder on top of it. And I could use that as a sliding dolly. But I found that I never ended up really using it. So if I if I want to do a dolly shot, I would either move the camera by hand, in which case I have to have autofocus on. I mean, t- technically I could have manual focus and I could move the camera at the same time as shifting the focus of the camera. But that's a little complicated. So if I can use the autofocus, I will. Um, but most of the time I'll just do a simple zoom in. So there's a difference between doing a zoom in and a camera dolly, right? In both cases, the camera are like, well, they are different. They are different. If you're zooming in, the camera doesn't move, right? But the picture is obviously being cropped closer and closer towards your subject. But in a, in the case of a dolly move, you're moving the camera physically towards the subject or away without um, without cropping the image. Um, but just because you're zooming in doesn't mean you're losing image fidelity. You know what I mean? Like Because as long as you're within the optical zoom range, there's no data loss. But when you're in the digital zoom range, when you're zooming really far in, that's when you're stretch you're stretching out the pixels pixels and that's when you get uh loss of quality in the image and you don't want that generally so 
whenever I'm zooming in, I'll tend to stick with like optical in the optical zoom range. So that's that's probably what that was, what you're referring to, because I don't recall doing a dolly move in the new bite. Although, I mean, every shot is like handheld. I mean, there's some there's some shots where I move the camera, but I don't know if it's like it's never on a dolly is what I'm trying to say. It's always a hand movement. So I always move it by hand, up, down, left, right, whatever. I don't use a physical contraption to move the camera. Have you done a vertigo shot? Uh, I have in the past, but often, most of the time there's not a need for it. Like, whether or not you should do a vertigo shot is determined by the story. You know? There's a reason Breaking Bad only ever had one vertigo shot. And it's for a huge moment in the story. And I'm not going to spoil it just in case there's people who haven't seen Breaking Bad. But there's only one vertigo shot in that whole series. And it uses it very wisely. And that shot has a very particular effect that you want to use sparingly, right? So, um, I'm not against vertigo shots. They're great. It's just you, the purpose has to be there. You have the you have to have motivation for the camera to operate or move in a certain way. You can't just move the camera for its own sake. That's bad filmmaking. The story determines the camera movements. It determines the camera placement. It determines the framing. The story determines everything. Anyway, there you go. Thank you, Brisk Hound. I really appreciate it, man. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Jojo, the meme dealer for sec 20, 20 sex, whatever the fuck that is. Sorry, man. I don't mean to. I'm, I'm just not familiar with that currency. YouTube abbreviates them in like three letters maximum, and I just, I don't know what they are. S-E-K, whatever that is. Uh, for 20, whatever those are, <laughs> whatever those are, says, do you like The Room? I think it's a good movie. Um, Just to be clear, we are talking about the Tommy Wiseau movie and not Room with Brie Larson, which is actually a good movie. But um, The Room, The Room is a so bad it's good movie. Now, I don't want to say it's a bad movie because Tommy Wiseau's The Room made me laugh my ass off the first time I saw it. So I don't want to say it's an outright bad movie, but it is a so bad it's good movie. Now, there's a, there's a lot of movies that fit that that category. It's like um, The Room is like entry level when it comes to that type of movie. There's also like Hard Ticket to Hawaii, Miami Connection. Um, I mean, most most films that are featured on in Red Letter Media's Best of the Worst series can be considered so bad they're good movies, at least whatever their top picks are out of the, the selection that they have. But yeah, there's like I, I, movies that make me really, really laugh, even if they're poorly made, I don't want to say they're bad movies. I would I would put them in that category of so bad they're good. Um cuz like even if a movie is really poorly made, if something can make me laugh really fucking hard, that's valuable. You know what I mean? And I'm glad that that movie was made th exactly the way it was. One Self, perfect example. I'm not shitting on Flick, I'm not shitting on One Self. I know he worked hard on that. There's a quality there's a quality to that that I think he would agree that is poorly it's poorly executed in terms of cinematography, line delivery. There's so many aspects of it, but it's so fucking funny and it's deliberately funny. And I am forever grateful to Flick for making me laugh that hard. So that's what I mean by like I wouldn't say his filmmaking is bad. If he can make me laugh that hard, that's I think that's good filmmaking in a way. The worst filmmaking is when it's boring. That's the worst sin that you can commit if you're a filmmaker. If your film is boring, that's the worst thing you can do. But even if your film is poorly made, if you can make people laugh their asses off, I don't think that's time wasted. Because laughter is just as valuable as an emotion as of an emotion as like 
moving somebody emotionally, like making them cry or whatever, making them think, making them laugh, I think is just as important. So that's what I think. I like The Room. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good, bad movie to answer your question. So there you go. Thanks, Jojo. Richard Richard Pilhofer for five bucks says, thanks for all the laughs over the years, John. Hey, you're welcome, man. I'm glad you enjoy it. Thank you, Richard. QPQRKJQ for 10 bucks says, thanks, th thanks for the reply. Here's your N-word pass, King. <laughs> Are you the guy who wrote the email? I'm not sure, but uh, I guess that's the implication. But um, thanks, man. I, ho I hope you were satisfied by my response, really. And um, if you have any more thoughts, um, I welcome you to to let me have it, you know. Anyway, thanks. Corey in the house, 81 for 35 bucks. Holy shit. It's fucking r making it rain here. Says, hey, Job, wanted to know what your thoughts are about The Last of Us 2 leaks and the controversy following it. Do you think the game is going in the right direction or is it huge failure? You're awesome. Hang in there, my guy. Thanks, man. That's very, very generous. Um, all right. Now, before I get into The Last of Us 2, I'm not going to spoil anything. Because I'm sure there are people who haven't read the leaks, who don't want the game spoiled, who are disregarding the whole controversy, and they're just like, I don't care. I'm going to buy the game when it comes out, and I'm going to enjoy it, hopefully. And I am not going to spoil it for those people. So I'm going to be very careful with the way I, f I talk about this. Because I, I do want to talk about it. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, I can't control what the chat does, obviously. So read the chat at your own discretion. But I don't, I don't mind the story. Look, people people tried to warn me over Twitter. They sent me DMs. Some people said, hey, just so you know, I know you're a big Last of Us fan. There's leaks of the sequel plot. The, pl the, the plot for the sequel have been leaked online. They're everywhere, all over the internet. So just be careful if you don't want to spoil yourself. And I really appreciated those warnings. But I don't give a fuck. I read them all. I read the leaks. I know what happens. I know the course of the whole course of the campaign. I know what happened. I didn't believe them at first. Or I wouldn't say I wouldn't believe it, but I was skeptical. But then I saw a bunch of leaked cutscenes that confirmed all the leaks. And they matched up. And I was just like, okay, the leaks are probably accurate. This is what the game is. And I don't hate it, to be honest. There's all this controversy around it saying it's been too influenced by SJW culture and woke wokeness look I because I see some people in the chat right now who are like you better not defend it I what I'm going to defend is the broad themes of the story that they are going after they want it I'm not spoiling anything this is all stuff that Naughty Dog has announced they want to tell a story about hate and they want to what do they want to do? Yeah, they want to tell a story about hate. And I read the leaks, and I determined that what they did was actually an effective way of telling a story about hate. I think in, in, ter in broad terms, what Naughty Dog did with the story, I think is good. Now, this story has obviously been influenced by progressive themes. Um, feminism, lesbianism, um, trans, le you can see those elements in there and them all playing major factors in the story. But I don't see that as a big problem, honestly. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not spoil any, spoiling anything. This was a character that was announced, that was revealed in the first trailer for Last of Us 2. 
um, there's a character who's a woman who is super muscular. Now, people are talking about her as trans, but I don't think that's been confirmed. I think maybe she's a, she's a biological woman who identifies as a man or possibly the other way around. Or maybe it's just a female bodybuilder. I'm not quite sure. But all I know for sure is that she's a f biologically female bodybuilder. And what the game... Like, p when a character like that is in the game, I feel like there's this whole group of like people who are like, oh, just because there's this female bodybuilder in the game, that means you're shoving sh this trans propaganda into the campaign and I really don't see that see it that way at all speaking as somebody who often rails against woke and overly PC culture honestly if I had a problem with it I'd say so I really don't because I don't believe that that's an unrealistic character it's, it's very reasonable to have a character in your story who's a female bodybuilder because they do exist. And I think that's an actually interesting character to have in the story. I'm not going to say what role she plays in the story because that would be spoiling. I'm, I'm trying to steer away from that. But what I'm saying is that, that it's not unrealistic to have a character like that. And it's actually... It's... It's thought-provoking to have a character like that in this story in particular, and I think it actually services the theme. And regarding Ellie being in a lesbian relationship, which is also not a spoiler because that was in one of the trailers. It was in the E3 reveal trailer. I don't care about that either because it's conceivable that I could play a character as a female who is a lesbian. You know, it's it's like it's it's different when it's like something like historical revisionism or like if it if it feels unrealistic. But the way Naughty Dog approaches these things, I don't ever feel like they approach things in an unrealistic manner. I think their approach has been pretty grounded and I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt regarding this game. Although I did hear some things about. The original game, the co-writers, Neil Druckmann, and there is a woman who I think played a key role. I can't remember her name. I'm angry that I can't remember what her name was. But she played a key role. She was like a co-director or co-writer or something. And she got let go. She, she Between The Last of Us 1 and 2, she was let go from the company for some reason. And, and now Neil has kind of taken over. The, Amy Henning, right. That's the name. So she kind of got the boot. And Neil Druckmann has kind of taken things over. And it might be because of him. that, like, I think he might have these progressive ideals that he wants to put in the game. Where Amy, when she was there, she was just like, let's stay away from that. Let's just focus on the story. Let's focus on the narrative, the relationship between these two characters. I feel like Amy played a critical role that's no longer being fulfilled in that in that company and now it's just up to neil and i feel like neil has these i think i think he's a really talented guy but he's he's now not hindered in terms of like putting progressive ideas in the game and i think that he may have let that influence him a little too much when coming up with this story but that said i don't Broadly speaking, I don't have a problem with The Last of Us 2 story in the way that it is. I actually think the way the game is structured, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm just saying the way The Last of Us 2 story is structured actually makes a good case for the theme. It's very serviceable to the theme of hate. It communicates that theme extremely well. Right. I wish I could go into more detail here. I just I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. I, just, I think the story, broadly speaking, is well executed, but it obviously has been influenced by SJW slash progress overly... I don't know if I want to say overly progressive, but progressive ideas, certainly, of like trans and lesbianism. 
And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Just because a, a game has a trans character or a lesbian character doesn't mean that I'm going to throw up a flag, a wave a flag going, oh, pr uh, f f what would you say? Like, um, um, this is SJW culture run rampant. It's ruining all our games and all this stuff. I don't want to be on that side of things, you know? But I'm not going to ignore the effect that AC SJW culture has had on this story but i am prepared to reserve judgment for when the game comes out i'm still gonna buy the game i think naughty dog are fucking great at what they do i think they make solid games i'm probably gonna really enjoy this game and um i'm actually i actually i like the care i'm well i don't know if i i mean i haven't seen the story yet up close but i think i like that character the, the, like the muscular character that was in the first reveal trailer for the game. I find her interesting. I don't know if she's trans or she identifies as a female or whatever. But either way, I don't really care. You know, as long as they tell a good story, that's all I care about. And I feel like they might still, despite all this controversy, the game will come out. And I think there's there's still a good story at the heart of this. So... That's my honest feelings on it. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to ride anybody's dick. I'm not trying to be on any either side of this thing going, you know, like boo SJWs and I'm not going boo racists or trans transphobes or whatever. Anyone who hates the game is a racist or you know, on this side where it's like, "Oh, you guys shoving SJW culture into all the media." Like I don't want to be on either side of that. I honestly both sides of this in regard to The Last of Us annoy me. And I think there's a there's a healthy middle ground to occupy, and that's where I want to be, you know. I, honestly, that's how I see the story. I think this game can be good despite all the controversy. Now, this is this is obviously aside from the stuff with Naughty Dog not paying their employees or whatever. Apparently, that's why the story got leaked in the first place is because people weren't being paid their bonuses that they were promised, right? So a common thing that game developers will do is that they promise their employees big bonuses at the end of a particular time frame, you know. But I think this virus might have thrown things, a wrench in things, in a way that nobody foresaw. And then certain people got their bonuses and then a bunch of employees didn't and they're pissed off because they made investments in their futures. Where they're just like, okay, I know I'm going to get this bonus at this um, at this time period so i'm gonna conduct my life and or my family in a way that i'm gonna get that money that i'm due when the time comes and then all of a sudden they don't and then all of a sudden their lives are thrown into the chaos where it's just like well what do we do now we're not getting the money we were promised so there's there might be some misconduct at naughty dog but now there's a bunch of news stories coming out that are countering that narrative saying Naughty Dog, uh, maybe they like they did pay their employees, and the leak came from some somebody outside of the company. I don't know, Could, because I'm, I think, Sony and Naughty Dog, I it's conceivable that they would try and if they made a mistake that they might try and cover it up, right? So maybe they did not, maybe they didn't pay their employees when they should have. And or maybe they couldn't. Maybe they just weren't in a position to because the money wasn't there. But the point is that promises weren't fulfilled. And people are obviously angry. And that anger obviously is justified. But I don't know who exactly is to blame. Because I'm, I'm just an outsider kind of observing this, right? All I can say for sure is that I'm still excited for The Last of Us 2. And um, I want to play it. I don't care about if there's a trans character or if Ellie's a lesbian. I really don't give a shit. You know? Because just because you have characters like that doesn't mean you're trying to force an agenda down my throat necessarily. Because there are lesbians. There are female bodybuilders who may or may not identify as men. I just, I really don't care. All that matters is the themes and the story itself. So, I'm excited about the game. And that's my thoughts on that and Naughty Dog and yeah.
Oh, yes, and Naughty Dog striking down channels. That I don't agree with, okay? So Naughty Dog has been on damage control, probably in, um, in cooperation with Sony, to um, silence people on Twitter, on YouTube, wherever, talking about The Last of Us. And I get why they're so angry, because Sony probably has a lot rolling on this game financially, and Naughty Dog would obviously be upset at having their... Like, this is a huge release for them. And to have the whole story leaked is a problem. And I un understand why they're upset. But it would seem to me that the reason the story was leaked in the first place was because people weren't getting paid what they were due. And so, I don't know what was going on at the company that made this leak possible. Maybe it's something that's not good, you know? And that deserves attention. All I can say is that I'm excited about the game. That's that's my thoughts. And I think I avoided spoilers, so I hope I did that. I hope I did a decent job of that. That's my thoughts. There you go. John is a fascist. Oh, there you go. I can't pull the wool over your eyes, can I? Uh, there's some comments in the chat that I want to read out right now, but they involve spoilers. And so I I made a point of avoiding spoilers, so I don't want to. But hey, look, if you don't agree with me, you don't have to agree with me. I'm not saying you have to. Um, but that's that's my thoughts. I, I'm actually on board with the storytelling direction that they're heading in. Anyway, there you go. Uh, let's move on here. Thank you, Corey into House 81. I appreciate it, man. Corwin Perry for four ninety nine says, John, your music was what got me into synthwave, synthwave a while back. Was wondering how your album is coming. Been a fan since fifth grade. Keep on keeping on. Thank you, man. Um, the album is going slowly, but I did make a new track. It doesn't have... It needs more work. It, it, it's pretty early in development, but it is fleshed out enough that I feel that I can let you guys listen to it. Do you guys want to hear it? it if it kind of sucks, I mean, like, it, I know it needs work, but I'd be happy to let you guys hear it if if you want. And you guys will probably be on board for that, right? I'll just, I'll load it up on, um, I'll load it up on FL Studio here. All right, so I'll let you listen to this. So let me, I just need to turn on desktop audio and that's on. So you know how I was talking about my album before and how each track is meant to represent a stage throughout one particular day where it's like, it's like you're on the highway evading police or cr criminals or whatever and then it's like you're on the same highway but things have slowed down and it's like sunset and then it's night the idea is like every hour is a different track and it would be a different vibe and it would be like across a 12 hour period so 12 tracks so this track I just called diner and it's meant to be like a pit stop right so imagine you're in one of those bullshit synth wave cars it's just like an 80s car with cool lights on it. You're driving along that highway, right? You stop the car. You see a diner. You see a 50s diner in the 80s. And you stop the car. And you go in. And you, you've you lost the cops or the criminals or whoever's chasing you. And you stop in the diner for, for a pit stop for some coffee and some bad diner food. But it's okay because it's a diner and it's awesome. Okay? That's the idea behind this track, okay? Here you go. Tell me what you think. I'll play you a little bit.
Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Okay, so so that's it. it. It went on for another 20 seconds, but you heard all the instrumentation there. You get the idea. You get what I'm going for. So so that would be that would be another track in there. So I'm still working on it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I wish uh, I really enjoy making music. So like, I don't know, like s some days I'm feeling it, some days not. But when I when I made that track, I was like, I was really in the mood to make music. I was just like, I haven't done this in a while. I should make another track. And I spent a few hours working on that. And I thought it turned out pretty well. Could use a nice low sub bass, but it's good, dude. I'm excited. Oh, thanks, dude. A sub bass. Hmm. I'm curious how that differs to like the um, the bass instrumentation that's already there. Hmm. I guess uh, an instrument that's even lower, I suppose. That's not as f staccato, where it's just like a st steady notes. I'll think about that. That's that's not a bad idea. Thank you for the input. Um, okay, so let's get back to the chats. I hope you enjoyed that. Where were we? Um, thank you, Corwin. Sloppy Dinosaur for five bucks says, Rank the current late night TV hosts. Their shows during quarantine have been awful. Can't they take hiatus? Say what you like slash don't like about each hosted show. Um, you know what? I haven't watched too many of them. I would say Craig Ferguson is probably my favorite. And then Stephen Colbert, but only because I used to like Stephen so much. Like when he was back on The Daily Show as a correspondent with Jon Stewart, and then he did The Colbert Report, I thought that was a great show. But then he went late night. And I feel like late night culture is like the fucking blob and it just swallows people and then they it swallows talented people and it turns them into these fucking milk toast like unfunny cretins where th every joke is just like Trump's bad. Am I right? <laughs> and then the audience obligatory obligatorily laughs and then it's like that's it. Like there's no depth to the to the comedy beyond that. Um, Conan O'Brien, I like him. I like Stephen Colbert a bit more, but if we're talking about what they all are now, I would probably now put Conan above Stephen Colbert. Trevor Noah, um, tr Trevor Noah's too. Um, I don't like him on the late show or the, not the late show, but, uh, the daily show. I don't really like his daily show material, but he doesn't write that. He has writers on that show who write his material, but I like Trevor Noah because I've seen his, I've seen his stand up, and I think his personal material, his material that he writes and performs on stage, I think is really funny. Um, but all the late shows they're too way too left leaning super liberal the they're just they're not funny that's the biggest crime i don't care what the political affiliation is i mean it just make it fucking funny for the love of god and i'm just i'm not laughing at those shows i'm watching those shows and i'm just like where's the laughs this is more cringe than funny and now they've all like they're all broadcasting from home now and it just sucks it's it sucks and honestly it's made me feel better about being a youtuber you know when i back when i was youtubing back in the day or even just like a year ago i used to be so self-conscious about the fact like god i'm just a fucking loser in his house streaming in front of a camera in his basement like i fucking suck there's so many people on youtube that are more entertaining than me like, I don't have a studio, I don't have an audience, or, like, not a physical audience, I mean, I obviously have you guys as an audience, but I just mean, like, it's obviously a different dynamic from this compared to having a room full of audience members who are laughing at you. You can hear the laughter, and you're kind of feeding off of that energy. That's a different dynamic to be in, and I, I'm kind of envious of that, 
but I'm also really terrified of that. Like I would love to do stand up comedy, but I I hate the idea of being on stage. So, you know, I would rather be doing this, but I felt really insecure in the past about doing it just because like, oh, who cares? I'm just some guy broadcasting with a webcam. But now since this virus, that's all the late show hosts are now. It's like everyone's just a loser broadcasting from their house. And it's it's made me feel pretty good about what I do. I'm just like, well, fucking hell. It's like they these guys, they lose their audience. They lose their studio space. They lose their crew. They lose their cameras. All of a sudden, their shows fucking suck. But then I can do what I do, and I have people who genuinely find my shit funny. So it's like maybe I'm doing something right here. Maybe Maybe I'm not such a fucking loser after all. <laughs> maybe it's worthwhile, you know, streaming from my... I mean, this is my basement. I live. I mean, this is my bedroom, but I am in the basement of a of a of a house. But that's that's okay, because every every broadcast is in a room somewhere, you know. So just to to demoral or delegitimize something just based on where it's filmed is totally stupid. You know, it's like who cares if something is filmed in a basement or whether it's a studio space, it's all the same fucking shit, you know? It's a camera in a room with some people in it, or maybe just one person in my case, and that's okay, you know? The important thing is, are you entertaining? Can you engage an audience of people, you know? And it's like, to do that, you just have to speak candidly, honestly. If you're funny, you try to let that out, let people see the comedy in you, and... I think I'm a pretty funny guy. I try to be. I don't always hit the mark. Not all my jokes land all the time, but I I try my best to be funny. But like, um, as long as you're at the very least engaging and you're speaking honestly, people will f- will be attracted to that, you know. But then, like, you see these late show hosts and they're stripped of all their resources, and all of a sudden they fucking suck, you know. And I mean, I just. I still I like Trevor Noah, James Corden. Uh, he's okay. I'll take him or leave him. I don't hate him. He's an okay. He seems like a nice guy, but I just I don't really care for his comedy. Trevor Noah I think is funny, except on the Daily Show. Um, but I think even when they're broadcasting from home, I think they have pre-written material, and it's like, dude, just speak candidly. I feel like that's that's the missing ingredient. You know what I mean? I don't speak off a script. When I'm talking into the mic right now, I'm not. I have some bullet points written down in a in a document in OneNote, but I'm not going off a script or anything. This is so totally unrehearsed. Like when I'm speaking in, into this microphone, it's raw, it's unfiltered. I don't mean to say that in like a badass way, like I'm fucking Howard Stern or something. I just mean like I'm speaking off the cuff. And I'm not thinking about a filter or what's okay or what's not okay. I'm just like, it's it's a vulnerable position, right? To just be speaking unfiltered to a microphone and then like everyone can hear it throughout the world, whoever tunes in, right? That's what I'm doing. And I feel like a lot of people aren't brave enough to do that. But the people that do do it, there's rewards to be reaped from that, you know, because there's a there's a hunger for that kind of content that's not being satiated you know so so that that's what i think yeah um i don't hate those late show guys i just i hate i hate that it's not funny certainly not funny enough like and it's just all it's all orange man bad you know, and it's like, okay, we get it. Trump's an egomaniac. Can we make a joke that's not about Trump? You know, like every question that Stephen Colbert asks his his guests or his audience is such a fucking loaded question. That's made. It's all his questions are specifically constructed to. They're loaded to make you agree with the idea that Trump is bad and to formulate an answer based on that predetermined axiom, right? And that frustrates the fuck out of me. I want people to just speak candidly and not be focused so much on that. 
Anyway, that's what I think. And all of a sudden, I don't feel so bad about be being a YouTuber. Because now all the late show hosts are YouTubers, and they fucking suck. And who's left that are actually funny? The actual YouTubers. People who broadcast on YouTube, and they speak fucking honestly. And that's what I try to do. Anyway. Yeah, there you go. Uh, let's move on. Thank you, Sloppy Dinosaur. Brisk Hound for $2 says, Love that joke John reads compliments about himself. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, I'm great. I'm great. What can I say? I'm the best guy ever. Okay, good night. River727 for $2 says, The ending to FF7 Remake is god-awful. I heard about that. I've also seen some clips of the cinematics that make me kind of like, oh, that kind of sucks. Like, um, did you guys see Video Game Donkey's review on FF7? I thought it was really funny. And it highlights an important point about Japanese cinematics where it's like it does that anime thing of characters grunting it's like when when a character is experiencing an emotion it can't just be played off of their facial expression they have to do like a weird little grunt where it's like <coughs> anime is full of that shit and it pisses me off <laughs> and apparently the F FF7 is full of that stuff and that's uh, it reminds me how like sometimes a game is better when it doesn't have voice acting you know it's like um, when it when it's just when you're just reading text which a lot of the Final Fantasy games have been all of a sudden when you put voices to the text it kind of sucks when it was actually better when it was just text. I think that's that's FF7 the remake is a prime example of that. I'm not saying all the voice acting is bad in the FF7 remake, but it has that anime fucking thing, you know. Anyway, that's what I think. The ending, I don't know. Like I'm aware of the story of the original game, but I don't know much about what the FF7 remake did. But I am aware of the controversy surrounding it where there were adjustments made to the game's story because of the episodic nature of the remake. There have been structural changes to the story, perhaps even thematic changes. But then at that point, if you're adjusting the storyline to that degree, is it still fair to call it a remake? Could, it, would you then have to call it a reimagining? if you're making adjustments to the story. So there's people who feel kind of cheated, I guess, where they're like, you said this was a remake, but the story is different. So how the fuck is this a remake? It's not the same story. And I kind of, I see their point, you know. So, but I don't know, I don't know how to feel about it personally because I haven't played the remake yet. I would like to. I think it looks, storyline aside, cinematics aside, all the anime bullshit aside, I think it looks like a fun game. The graphics are fucking, like, terrific. The combat looks really fun. Apparently the materia system is well implemented. So, maybe it's really good. Like, I don't know. I would love to try it. I think my roommate's going to get it. Although he may have changed his mind <laughs> based on the, the fucking anime shit. Because I showed him the donkey review. And he was just like, ugh. ugh. <laughs> He's cringing at all the fucking anime grunts. You know. Anyway, um, we'll see. I would like to play it. If he doesn't buy it, I'll probably get it because I I think it looks like a good game. Anyway, let's move on. Celtic Horn for ten bucks says to your early points, I like that Arbiter and Chief, despite having constant polarizing arguments, can grow from each other when a solid point is made. Yeah, totally. I mean, if if I can, I wouldn't say I'm smart enough to like 
achieve that in every single episode that I do. But when I do, if I feel like I can achieve that, I'll certainly gravitate towards that where both characters can evolve. Usually it's just one, if either of the characters evolve at all. I think a lot of the time, especially Bites episodes, the characters end in kind of a stalemate where none of them really change. It's just, um, you know, character growth is impeded in service of a, f a joke that I think is funny or whatever. Like the joke is that they don't change. That's usually the ending of most bites. Anyway. Thanks, Celtic Corn. I appreciate it, man. Sloppy Dinosaur for $2 says, Love how wine chills both of us out. Your favorite type? I really don't give a shit, man. I, I look at the price label. I'm like, that's the cheapest one I can find on this shelf. I'm getting that one. That's really all that went through my mind. I usually get this like Australian Shiraz. I forget the name. of Yellowtail. That's it. I would get that over and over. But I saw a wine near it that was cheaper. And I was just like, you know what? I'll try that one. I don't fucking care. They're all, they're all red. They're all Shiraz. I'm sure it's probably doesn't taste that different. I'm just looking to get... I just want the alcohol buzz. That's all I'm after. So like... When it comes to like the nuance in the taste between one wine or another, I really don't fucking care. Thanks, Sloppy Dinosaur. Adam K for five dollars says, says, "It's amazing how even though we know where Jimmy McGill ends up, we still want to see how it happens, and yet we still root for him to be better." Well, yeah, that's, I think that's one of the fascinating things about Better Call Saul. Um, there's, there's an underlying tragedy to it because ultimately you know how things turn out. But as, t as to the specifics of how they turn out that way, it's still uncertain. So it's compelling as far as that goes. And I agree. It's, we want to see how it happens. We want him to be better. But we know he's going to devolve into the character that eventually becomes the Saul in Breaking Bad, where he's just kind of abandoned all morality. Not all morality, but I would say most of it, you know. Anyway, thanks, Adam. Sloppy Dinosaur for five bucks says, Tell us any stupid memories slash stories you have with the Digital Fear Forum back in 2008 to 10 -ish. Managing it, the people on it, community, game nights, etc. Uh, sure. Um, I remember it hurt my feelings. I mean, not all the time, but... I mean, just overall, it was a lot of work. Like, I felt like a parent. It was really weird, and I found it really frustrating. And I was just like, I don't want to waste time doing this. I was like a forum janitor of my own forum and I, I wouldn't like delete comments just because they criticize me but like I would re I would all I would always read comments that were criticizing me and um, I think there was this one poster who compared me to like a I forget the context in which he said this but he compared me to like a used cum rag <laughs> that's that was, I remember those three specific words are what he said, but I can't remember the context of it, whether he, he was comparing me to that or my content. Either way, it was something offensive towards me. He was not being kind to me. And it not only offended me, but it annoyed me because I'm just like, why are you even here, dude? It's like, you don't even seem to like me that much, but you like, you're on this forum spending your time posting about me and like you're you're here frequently i think because the same guy not only would he participate in the forums but we also had like an irc chat that we would go on and uh i don't know it's just um i just i found it a big distraction from like just working on the show and then I did one or two community game nights on, like, Halo 3, I think it was, on Xbox Live. We would just fuck around on, like, Foundry or something in Forge mode. And everyone, I remember those, everyone was really nice. 
no one was mean to me on those. Everyone was super nice, but like it was just a uh, cacophony. You know what I mean? It's just like 50, I mean, it was 16 players per server, right? So it was 15 people just squawking through my headset. And I couldn't even like, I'm not shitting on anybody, but I just, I couldn't, there's so many people talking at once that I couldn't make out what anyone was saying. And it was just a headache. And it was super laggy because it was a full server and not everyone had a great connection. So it was full of fucking lag and high pings. And um, I just, I was just kind of irritated. And I, I didn't like, I didn't enjoy the community game nights after a couple of them. And the, the forum was just kind of, you know, it was just a drag. Because, like, every day I was expecting, like, okay, what shitty things about me am I going to have to read today? And it's just like, why am I doing this? Like, this is all time I could be spending just working on my show. But instead, I'm fucking cleaning up a forum where people are talking shit about me. Like, how the fuck? What's the point? You know, this is stupid. So I just stopped doing it. And I'm just like, I'm not doing that again. And people have asked me to. People have asked me to host, like, community game nights. What is a cum rag? Do guys come into rags? Is it? Yeah. Is that? Yes, it is a thing. So I get, he was comparing. I don't know what he was comparing me to. But basically, he was trying to. It was some mild character assassination where he was comparing me to something that was easily discardable or disposed of, you know? Because if you have a cum rag, you want to throw it out, right? Because it's gross. So, like, I don't know. I wish I could forget. I wish I could remember exactly what it was he said. I just remember those words in particular. But I was just like, oh, fuck you, dude. Like, if you're not a fan of me, you could just, like, not... You don't have to type anything mean. You could just, like, not participate. You know what I mean? Like, but these people want attention, you know? And that's... I find that's ultimately what the case is at the heart of these issues. God, like, I remember mo way more recently, there was a guy on Facebook who wrote shit about me on... F uh, I think it was in response to a post I made on my studio page. Oh, yeah, I, I released part a of episode 13 and it was just like the first 10 minutes and i got a lot of dislikes on that video because everyone was confused they were like what the fuck is this where is this going i don't understand i don't understand where this is going at all in terms of storytelling like and it's like yeah obviously because it's part a you got to watch the whole episode to get it but like I put part A out and I posted it on Facebook and then some guy wrote on Facebook. He was just like, dude, you've fallen so far from like, I can't, he, he, like he put, he put me on this pedestal and he said I'd fallen so far down from what I used to be. And like, I'm basically a disgrace now. I'm, tr I'm paraphrasing, but I'm trying to remember what exactly he said, but he was just really not nice. He wrote a whole paragraph about how I just wasn't what I used to be and I was slipping. I think that's one of the words he used. And I wrote this whole post saying, look, why don't you just wait until the whole episode comes out and then you can decide because I actually put a lot of thought into this, believe it or not. And then as soon as I responded to him, the fact that I responded to him was enough to make him do a complete 180. And then he responded again saying, oh, hey, it's uh, I just want to say it's an honor to talk to you. And I was just like, fuck off. So you're telling me you only wrote this to get my attention. And, and then I, all of a sudden I realized I had already suspected beforehand, but then at that point I had it confirmed where it was just like a lot of these people who write bullshit, like they just want, there's, it's a cry for attention. And then they, you give them that attention and then they spin completely around and all of a sudden they're, the, they're your best friend. And, um, it was like, well, was, was writing that negativity really necessary in the first place? I mean, it wasn't like that part A of episode 13 was shitty. There was, I think there was serious cinema, serious merit in terms of cinematography and writing, even though it wasn't all the, all the context wasn't there to make you understand the sophistication of it. I'm not saying it's so great or anything. I'm just saying like, I put a lot of thought into it and I felt it deserved a bit more merit than it was, than it was getting. 
and but but if people don't think it's good that's fine but that he the way he his writing in particular was just so like hostile but all it took was for me to give him a bit of attention and he turned right around and it's like what he wrote in the past didn't even happen and i'm just like you know what that's probably the case with a lot of these types of people where they just they're looking for attention that's it you give it to them and then it's that's it it's like it didn't even happen and that annoys me you know it's just like why can't you just have the the discipline in the first place to just not be an asshole you know what am i certainly am i going to warm up to you just because like i don't know like i th- i just think that that sucks what that guy did and like this it was the same with the forum thing where that guy in the IRC chat he was acting like he was a good friend but then when i wasn't there and he was just alone on the forum talking with his whoever he considered friends on the forum he would just be very disparaging towards me and unfair unjustly you know critical and um i'm not saying that people can't have negative opinions on me but i'm just saying when i was in that position of being a forum janitor I know every day it was my job to read nasty things about me and clean them up or not. I wouldn't delete comments unless it was like pornographic or something. But just the mere fact that I had to go through them and read them and like feel shitty. I was like, I don't fucking deserve this. <laughs> like I'm, j- I'm trying to make cool content here and like this is just a waste of my time. So I just stopped doing it. And I said, I'm not going to do the forum thing anymore. I'm not doing the the community thing the community gaming thing because it's just a it's just a mess of noise coming through my headset and i can't even make out what anyone's saying so whatever i'll just fucking forget all that shit and i'll just focus on making content and that's what i ended up doing and people have asked me to reboot the the forum they've asked me to do community game nights and i'm just like i try to be nice about it i'm just like hey look it's cool that you want this to happen but i did this in the past and i just wasn't a fan so i just don't really want to do it anymore sorry and i still don't so yeah isn't this why you get mods yeah but well i'm i'm apprehensive to giving anyone moderate moderate of administrative powers just because you know i don't know who's on the other end of things you know and who am i to judge who's fit for the job and who isn't like i don't fucking know um my only reference is what you write i mean anyone could anyone could fool me and convince me that they're the right man for the job and then once i give them the power then they they rule out all these or they dish out all these unjust bans or suspensions or whatever i don't want that to happen but even if they were good at their job and they were the right fit i don't like I feel like I don't have to recruit moderators. I feel like you guys are mostly cool. I mean, sometimes I'll do a stream and there'll be some shithead who spawns or who, who spams some fucking stupid hashtag or like I don't know what what was it last time I did a podcast? It was like to ban a particular user or something. People were spamming, ban this guy. Like who the fuck is that guy? I don't know that guy. But apparently he like he was being a shitlord in the chat earlier on or something. I don't know. Or on the Discord. Yeah. Because I, I don't participate in the Discord. I don't really know what's going on in there. So like people cause drama in there. I don't want to I don't want drama. I want to stay away from drama, okay? I don't want any of that. There's drama in the Discord and I'm just not interested. And people sometimes carry that into here. And I don't know what the fuck they're talking about, obviously. I'm just like can you just work it out amongst yourselves? Like, do I have to fucking... Why do I have to be this fucking father figure that steps in and be like, okay, now, boys, like, and girls, whoever. I don't know. It's probably boys. I'm like, well, come on. Smarten up, you guys. <laughs> That's stupid. Just fucking work it out amongst yourselves. And if you're being harassed on Discord... Guess what? Close fucking Discord and do something else. That's all you have to do. Anyway. 
Uh, there you go. There's a little story for you. I hope that was good. Thanks, Sloppy Dinosaur. Brandon Vancouver for $2 says, What film school did you go to? Um, I went to um, Capilano University in North Vancouver. I took their four-year film production program. And um, it wasn't great, but it was decent in that I... I learned a lot of hands-on experience. I learned a lot about set protocol, and I learned a lot about editing audio and recording audio. So I have my gripes with it, but I feel overall it was worthwhile attending. But I definitely I definitely have some problems with it. Anyway, there you go. Thanks, Brandon. Canuck Coon for five bucks says, One Life Remaining reboot? Fuck no. Although I have been toying with the idea of doing another Hard Justice episode. I'm not confirming anything, okay? But I have had this idea kicking around in my head of doing like maybe two or three Hard Justice episodes, like a mini-series. Just like three episodes or something. But I haven't fleshed it out yet. I have this idea for like a climax, but I don't know if I'm going to like... I don't want I don't know I don't know if I actually want to do it. I've got plenty of other shit to do right now. I've got bites in season 8 to fucking work on. But it is something I've been kicking around in my head of something to do. I kind of I kind of don't want to do it just purely based on the fact that the three main characters are all me at varying pitches and I just think that's like it's cringe. You know. I don't want to make cringe. <laughs> Not anymore. I had that phase where I didn't th I didn't really think about that, but now it's looking back on it. I'm like, "Oh, that's cringe." But I got no I got no plans to bring one life remaining back. I just got no I just I got nothing. I don't really want to return to it. Sorry. Anyway, thanks Kanuk. Kaduk. Canucks sends another five bucks. No text. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Hope that wasn't a mistake. Um, Slendy for five pounds says, what are your view on pedestrians and the big pedestrian issue Twitter has currently? Are you talking about like Twitter having a legitimate pedophile problem? Because I'm not aware of that. I knew there was something on YouTube about that which is obviously a problem that should be addressed but um twitter i didn't know about that um i'm gonna just move along here because i want to wrap this up because it's getting pretty late now sorry guys but i am lit tired <laughs> but i do want to stream again actually tomorrow hopefully i want to do a video game stream tomorrow if that's cool with you guys i'm thinking of doing a resident evil 3 remake run through tomorrow for the first episode of my new game show. I hope that's cool. Um, so, we'll see. Um, so I would, I would do, I'm going to do a gameplay stream and then I'm going to talk in front of the camera about the game and then I'm going to use all that footage for the first episode and make a, make a thing out of it. And then like the, the full gameplay playthrough It'll be public for anybody who tunes in live, but then I'll make it, if you want to watch the pre-recording, then I'll put that on Patreon for, like, uh, the bonus stream content tier people. But the, the episode of Super Game Show, my game, my new game show that I make out of all that footage, that'll be public. So everyone can watch that. If you, even if you're not a Patreon guy, you can. Or girl. Sorry, I don't I don't mean to be gender exclusionary. Um yeah, I'll put that public so everyone can see it. Anyway. Okay. Let's move on. Um Thank you, Slendy. Cameron Shelley for two dollars says random reminder that Blade Runner twenty four Blade Runner twenty forty nine is amazing. I agree, that movie kicks ass. I am in full agreement with you there. I actually think it's better than the first movie. Even I think the first movie is terrific, 
and I think the second movie's even better. Actually, you know what? I gotta watch the first one again just to make sure. It's been a while. They're both great, though. Thanks, Cameron. Ralph J for 500 yen says, Job, thanks for the laughs. Are you excited for Cyber Bigot <laughs> 2077? Also, what do you think of Borderlands 3 when it comes to the comedy aspect? I haven't played Borderlands 3, so I'm not really sure. Um, Cyberpunk 2077, absolutely. I'm stoked for that game. I think it's going to be cool. Um, I saw some gameplay recently. This guy, whoever was playing, he was like, bouncing bullets off the wall and like shooting some guy around a corner based on like ricochet trajectory i was like that's fucking cool man that's i think that game's gonna be awesome yeah i'm looking forward to it thanks ralph and then kirkland signature for 199 says desi is a wannabe master manipulator oh i don't know i like desi i don't know what he's done this time to 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 make you hate him but i think he's a cool guy anyway thanks kirkland and i'm just going to check stream labs so we got some we got some um we got some donations on stream labs that i want to get uh, that i want to address before we go um fat schlong <laughs> says for 281 says thanks for st what's with all these weird numbers 281 what made you decide that that must be a currency conversion thing that was probably an even number and some other currency because all of these get uh all of these amounts get trans or translated to canadian dollars anyway uh thanks for streaming again sooner than usual i love listening to these at work do more or i'm pissed bleed purple Hey, I'm glad you enjoy it, man. Thank you for that. Jesse for 703. No text, but thank you, man. Greatly appreciated. And Oxy for $5 says, If you're actually wondering, I'm gay, and I think we should absolutely say gay, f absolutely say fag and faggot and things that, things like that in a funny context. Anyway, I wanted to know if you ever quit smoking, and if so, how? Um... First of all, I just got an F-word pass from a real gay guy. Not only did I get an N-word pass from a real black guy, I got a real F-word pass from a real gay guy. I've got an F-word and an N-word pass, you guys. I am unstoppable. I'm invincible. <laughs> Nothing can stop me saying these words now. <laughs> a real black guy, that's right. <laughs> Um, anyway, I wanted to know if you would ever quit smoking, and if so, how? Uh, yeah, vaping. Sounds Kind of sounds like a joke. Not a joke. Vaping is what helped me quit cigarettes. I weaned myself off of real cigarettes by vaping nicotine. And eventually, I just kind of stopped vaping. I don't know what, what made me stop vaping, because I was quite addicted to the vaping. Like, whenever I would lose my vape pen, I would lose my shit. I'd be like, what the fuck is it? I'd be tearing up. I'd be throwing the couch cushions up, I'm searching everything. Like, what the fuck did I leave it? Now, like, I eventually just weaned myself off of it. And now I'm just like, you know what? I can get by without it. And eventually I just put it down entirely. I didn't touch it again. And uh, I guess I think I was kind of concerned at the time with the health risks because I was hearing about people having, like, heart attacks based on, like, vaping too much nicotine. And I was just like, oh, fuck, I don't know what. I don't want that happening to me. And then, um, I don't know. It just, it just wasn't a struggle. I don't know exactly what it was. I didn't chew gum. I didn't try nicotine gum or anything like that. I just, I knew I was addicted to cigarettes. I started vaping. I was addicted to vaping. And then my craving for vaping just kind of went away. I think because I, I used it. I used it less and less in a over a gradual period, you know? S and I think that really helped where, uh, you know, at, at eventually it got to the point where there a, a whole day would go by and I wouldn't vape once. 
and then it was like two days and then three days and then one day i was just like you know what i don't need that anymore it's stupid and then i just stopped and then for some reason i can like if i'm in, like at a party or something i'll still smoke a cigarette if someone offers me a cigarette or i have a pack on me that i bought specifically for the party i'll smoke a cigarette but then i'll have one or two or, or two and then I'll put it down, and then I don't have any more cravings. In fact, I actually feel gross after I smoke a cigarette now. And I'm just like, oh, I don't, that's sucked. I don't want to do that anymore. And I feel like if I'm the next time I'm at a party, I'm not even going to smoke a cigarette or do anything. Like, I just don't need it anymore. You know? <laughs> so there you go. And that wraps up the Streamlabs donations. And it wraps up the Super Chats. And I believe that wraps up this podcast. So I'm going to end it here, guys. Sorry. I know some of you are going to be disappointed, but it's getting late. We've done, like, what, how many? Like, at least six hours altogether. I'm getting pretty tired. I'm running on steam here. i got to go and lie down for a bit. Sorry. But, hey, thank you for tuning in. I think we did a good podcast today. I mean, compared to, like, how it what podcasts are usually like I think I was pretty open and honest today and I talked about some real shit and I think it w- I think it went pretty well so and I, I think it was f- it was probably I think it was it was a funny show right we had a good time I think it was funny anyway I think it was a good show I hope you guys enjoyed it thank you as always for the oh shit one more before I go I want to announce my um, Patreon people because I got a bunch of new subscribers today and I said I'd give them a shout out um, going forward because I feel like my pa- my Patreon supporters are neglected on the podcast. And I just want to announce who my new subscribers were this month. Um, I'll just do that before I go. I imagine you don't want to, most of you don't want to stick around for that. That's okay. But, uh, this is something I just want to, I want to get out there. Sorry. So, um, let's look at new patrons. Hmm. Why is it not showing me? Oh, here we go. Okay. So. Uh, for April, um, Saki Galaxidus, Ouroboros 4201, Serpent Monkey, Cyrus J. Peshevar, Connor Yacklin, Justin Aguayo, Leaf Dodil, Jana Vis, holy shit, Vis, Visco Clova. I'm sorry, I'm f- butchering the pronunciation of that. Mike Laporte, Parker Russell, The Clutch, Harry Davies, KG Willikers, Farad Albers, Jesse Espinoza, Nathan Stuckey, Andiel, Me, oh, yeah, Andiel, Daniel, Master Chiff. Andrew Bouchard, Dylan, Michael Smith, Rendell, Randall, Rundell, I guess, I don't know, Elliot Gill, Gabriel Ignacio, Final Heaven 63, Philip Chow, Lunespian, Lunespian, and Brandon Rawson. Those are from April to May. So thank you all, all you uh, new Patreon supporters, I really appreciate it, man. I've been getting so much support lately, and it's fucking, it's been awesome. Like DMs, emails, uh, supporters, the super chats. Did I say DMs? I think I did. But, um, I mean, other than that weird alt-right cultivating thing, I haven't been getting a bad word said to me, and I have to, I gotta give you guys credit for being such a fucking awesome audience. So, thank you for being so 
thank you for being so supportive. It means a lot to me. As somebody who's suffered from moderate to severe depression for most of my life, I have to say that I've been unusually happy for the past couple months, despite the pandemic. And I have you guys largely to thank for that. So thank you for making me feel like um, sp I'm spending my time wisely. That's all. All right. That's it. Thanks so much, guys. And um, I'll see you next time, probably tomorrow. I'm going to do, I think I'm going to do a game stream tomorrow. So I hope you guys tune in for that. And I'm going to use that as footage from, for my first episode. I'm going to do like, I'm going to get a, I'm going to do a bunch of streams and then get like a, a backlog of like episodes of my new game show and then try and get some lead time. You know what I mean? So like by the time the first episode comes out, maybe I'll have a few made. I don't know. We'll see how quickly I can make them because it, it might be relatively, it might be quick relative to an Arby and the Chief episode, or maybe it'll take more time than anticipated. I'm not quite sure, but we'll see. So I'm just going to do this one day at a time, and tomorrow I'm going to stream Resident Evil 3, the remake. So I hope you guys are down for that. Thank you, guys. Take care. I'll see you again soon. Thanks again.